Passeroda, the German premium. Buyers. So let's take a look at the lineup for today's race. As we mentioned, it is race 12 of 20. Kenny Breck on the pole with that bonus point, doubling his lead. Alex Tagliani in second, and then Scott Dixon and uh, Gilles de Ferrand third and fourth. Yes, the two Ford Cosworth cars there at the front of the field, Breck and Tagliani, then uh, the Toyota of Dixon and the Honda of de Ferrand. And once again, of course, very little to choose between those three power plants, but certainly for the rest of the weekend, the Toyotas have been looking very, very strong indeed. And I think the Fords were not quite, uh, not quite ultimately as quick but in uh, qualifying they came through to take that front row of the grid and in the sixth row it is Jimmy Vassar and Patrick Carpentier and further back it is uh, Toro Takagi and Roberto Moreno and then we have uh, Mauricio Guzman and Brian Herter who is looking to uh, try and get a good result here for the Forsyth team at Road America that's right, and that, uh, what's the most interesting, I think, is those guys at the back of the field. We've got uh, Zanardi, Tracy, Franchini, and Fernandez at the back. They've all won races uh, before, and most of them have won here as well. So they've got a lot of work to do, but they can do it from there, even at this racetrack. All right, so Kenny Breck will lead them away from the pole position, and when we go green, we'll have 53 laps remaining. Beautiful facility here at Road America. Been running, racing here since 1954, I believe. I think that's right, 54. But uh, made some improvements over the years, and just a fantastic uh, facility. Dario Franchini scored his first ever win here, and Dario is also talk of the weekend because Jeremy he has signed a contract with uh, Team Cool Green. He's going to stay right where he is until at least 2003. Yes. A relief for Dario Franchitti. He's, uh, he loves where he is right now. He really enjoys this series. He's got a great team around him, and he is very, very competitive in every single race. He was second in the championship two years ago, and he wants to win it for Team Cool Green. I'm really happy to, to be doing the extension. You know, that was that was the main reason I did it. it made, you know, made me comfortable to uh, to stay at the team. No, F1's definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's still in my mind, but. Uh, yeah, we talked about it and, you know, it, it seemed the best option, the two-year thing. Uh, you know, Barry's been very good to me um, since, since I joined the team and, you know, it's, uh, it makes sense. And you heard him mention the F1 there, of course there isn't anywhere for him to go. And I said watch out for poor Tracy and Dario Franchitti to do something sneaky. Well, they've come into the pits and I think they're going to add some fuel here, but it's probably still too wet to change to the slick tyres. But obviously starting at the back, they have no track position to lose and they're not making any l l losses that way by pitting right now. I think they'll just come in, top off and send them back out. That's exactly what they will do and just uh, two or three gallons of fuel, you know, that's uh, pretty crucial at this sort of a racetrack which is four miles around so you can... Uh you, you've got to be very careful with your fuel consumption because you, you really use two gallons per lap here at Road America when you're at full chat. And uh, so you've got to be with only 35 gallons of fuel on board. Fuel consumption is crucial and planning your fuel strategy. And uh, when you make those pit stops, you've got to make sure you don't run out of fuel. And uh, a lot of drivers have done that here in the past. I mentioned earlier that Dario Franchini scored his first kart career win here at Road America. We had a chance to speak to him and look at that. Nineteen ninety-eight, his first win, and uh, absolutely ecstatic. Then he went on a pretty good roll that year after that win, and uh, went on to score some more victories. But Dario really loved winning here at El Cup. Yeah, big party afterwards for Dario Franchitti. I think uh, they were well into the late night at Seepkins. I don't know whether you were there with them celebrating, guy. Uh, no, 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 no. no. Uh, but yes, it, it was fairly legendary. And Christian Fittipaldi, of course, scored his first kart career win here too. And he had a very good evening. Yeah, we've got Alex Tagliani, he's starting on the front row here. He's looking for his first champ car victory. And also Memo Gidley, who will start eighth. He too looking for his first victory. And his teammate Bruno Junquero. So three drivers among the top ten yet to have a champ car win to their name. And certainly all three of them should be contenders here this afternoon when we finally get this race underway. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's getting pretty dry now for most of the way around the track. And I think it's about time to get this race started, OK? There's one place on the track where it's very, very wet but the drivers know that now they've driven three three or four times under yellow flag conditions and i think we should be getting this race underway yeah, you mentioned looking for their win there jeremy and here's the list of guys looking for their first victory lane and their starting positions here today as uh, jordan obviously he's got his work cut out to come from 20th and meccano from 21st 
But Tagliani, he's looking very strong here this weekend. Yeah, it's pretty amazing though, isn't it? There's uh, just eight drivers there that have yet to win a champ car race. That means 18 of the 26 have at least one win to their name. That's an amazing statistic. All right, well... We are apparently going to go green flag this time by. Pace cars should pull into pit lane. We know Dario and Paul Tracy have both topped up on fuel. And it's going to be a single file start and no overtaking before the start finish line because they come up the hill from turn 14, which is where Kenny Brack is right now. And it's totally blind for these drivers as far as the uh, start flag. There you can see as they go up the hill, they won't be able to see the start flag and Jim Swintal until they have come underneath the bridge that crosses over at the top of the hill there. Nemo Gidley, on board with him as he goes up turn 14. All the campers off to the left, being some big crowds here, they're all hiding right now and the pace car has stayed out, so they're going to do one more lap. Yeah, given the one finger there from Jim Swintel, so it'll be one more lap before they finally get this race underway. There'll be five laps uh, under, under yellow flag conditions and uh, I think the crowd certainly is getting a bit restless. I'm certainly getting a bit restless. I think they should have started this race already, but finally we're going to get it underway next time around and hopefully these guys will be able to keep it on the track and keep the race going. See if anybody else uh, stops into the pits and tops off. Yes, Michelle Jourdain, a whole bunch of people coming. Jourdain, Nakano, Max Pappis, Zanardi, and Adrian Fernandez. So all those guys making a pit stop. Mimo Gidley stayed out under the Briggs and Stratton Bridge at the back there. There you see Max Pappis getting his fuel. Michelle Jourdain's got his and gone back out. I believe the pit lane speed limit is 50 miles per hour this weekend. It always is, actually. Every race now, they, 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 for a while there, it was different on different tracks, but they standardised it now, and it is, as you say, 50 miles an hour. And uh, what's it, what is slightly different here, though, is the fact that uh, the pit lane speed limit starts uh, about 300 feet before the first occupied pit. Generally speaking, the, the speed limit is, in effect, just from the first occupied pit to the last occupied pit, but here, a little bit longer, and that means uh, that you spend more time on that pit lane going slowly. A very big pit lane here at Road America, a very long pit lane. They extended it a few years ago, but they are now able to, uh, in fact, pit all the kart cars, the Trans Am cars, and the Toyota Atlantic cars on one pit lane. Yeah, it is fairly amazing, but certainly it's a bit of a bit of a problem for the first two, seven or eight uh, pits because they're still on the upslope, and after that it levels out and it's pretty level uh, all the way through to the end of the pit lane. But the first few teams, and that's Newman Haas, uh, Archero, Blair, Fernandez Racing, and the Herdes team, they're all uh, starting on a pretty substantial slope, which makes things a little bit tricky when you come into a rest and getting to getting going again after the tyre change. Looking backwards towards turn seven the right hander for left on your left is a pitcher now Kenny Brack into turn eight the left hander off to the left there you can see the brand new Briggs and Stratton Motorsports complex go-kart track they've built hope to get some laps in on that a little later uh, on this year somewhere now you see them into the carousel and carousel if the car is set up right and everything's going well, you can almost ride that flat all the way through the carousel and then continue that through turn 11, which is the kink. Uh, but you have to be pretty brave to go flat through there. Overhead view then of Kenny Brack and Alex Tagliani, the first two cars as they lead the field through the kink right here. And the thing with the kink is there's very little runoff area to the left-hand side if you do go off. And if you go off, you're doing about 190 miles per hour. That's very true. Look, look there, look at all that standing water there. They're still splashing their way through there, but the rest of the track is quite dry now. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how these tyres cope with that. It's also going to be very interesting to see how the drivers cope on the first up. Also down there into, uh, in the braking area for Canada Corner. It's very, very wet there as well. The other thing now, Jeremy, now they're all starting on wet weather tyres. They're going to be looking for water now on these tyres because they go away so quickly on a dry track and like the whole front straightaway is, is totally dry right now. Yeah, it's almost dry, you're right. It's still going to be pretty slippery though, so certainly for a few laps uh, it's going to be okay. And with that standing water down there by the kink, that'll slow, the, that'll cool the tyres down somewhat. Uh, but as you say, it's a long runner uphill here, the main straight, and also downhill into turn five as well. But here we go, there goes the pace car, pulls into pit lane, we're getting ready for a start. Single file start, Kenny Brack taking the lead. You cannot overtake before the start finish line. They're going to be fairly spread out because some cars are still in turn 14 as Brack goes underneath the Motorola bridge, looks for the green flag from Jim Swintal, and there it is. We are racing at Road America in the Road America 220. Down into turn one. 
Tagliani nowhere near. Hopefully he'd be a bit closer, but Brack managed to get a good jump on him there. Yeah, we saw Junkera there inside. I think that was Christian Filippoli trying to make a pass for ninth place. Coming down the hill, there's Cristiano De Matta. Down the inside to Scott Dixon, and uh, Castro Neves tried to go through as well. And yes, he does make the pass. Castro Neves gets by Dixon as well, and Amado, and we also saw Max Wilson coming up a couple of positions there too. There you see the two cool green cars at the back. But Brack racing out of turn three, that left-hander is, they call it turn four, not much of a turn. Look and straight down to five, this is where we'll see a lot of overtaking. Yeah, look at that, uh, a couple of cars there, particularly Dixon and also Damanis, staying down to the inside there, trying to keep their car tyres cool, as that was uh, both of the target cars were on board with Mamo Gidley. Now that is Scott Dixon just ahead of him, looking up to the inside up the hill to turn six, that's not going to work. Tucks in behind the two cars, there's... Oh, Ooh. Dario Franchini once again with Oriol Servia this time. They're both off the road, and that's the turn five exit. Turn five, they obviously got on the power a little too early. It's Tagliani goes for the lead, and he gets by Kenny Bradbury, but then he goes off the road. <laughs> oh, and he loses two positions. Wow, look at that. Look at this side by side. It's Gilles de Ferran on the outside there. That's not the place you want to be going through the carousel. And Tagliani seems to get a very good run off here. Can he make a move going down towards the king? Tagliani tucks right underneath Kenny Brack's wing, almost lost that position. And now we're going to come running out to that water. Look, Look at that, that spray. Is. Wow, that's a lot of water there. We've got 850 horsepower. That's uh, going to make it very tricky indeed. But here comes Kenny Brack. It's still very slippery. There's Tori Takagi off the road. We've seen that several times this weekend. He's been very quick all weekend, but he's also had a lot of spins. Yeah, Toro Takagi's been uh, off a lot. Oh, yeah, that's, that's uh, Herta and Wilson. Uh, and that is, that's that is that's that wet track part of the track coming out of the kink. And I don't know who lost it uh, there, but they collected the two of them. That's Wilson on the left-hand side of the screen and Herta on the right. And that was the danger point. That was a piece, that was a piece of track that the officials were worried about. Brian Herta is absolutely furious. You can see there as he gets out of the car and walks away. And you're right, that's where that did happen. We have gone full course yellow. Everybody slows down, comes by the start-finish line. Brian Herter is still screaming at Max Wilson. Yeah, he's absolutely livid. And Max, Max Wilson is, uh... is screaming at somebody else. So, we'll <laughs> try and find out here. It's, if we can look through the mist here, we'll take a look back and see what happens. Whoa! Oh, Wilson, like, like Wilson just drove straight over the top of Herter's car. And, and that connected. Is that Paul Tracy Paul, as well? That's Paul Tracy they ran into, who was already off to the right of the track. Wow, and Brian Hurt has been run over here before. If you remember, he sat in turn five one year when Michael Andretti came running up over on him. Wow. And that was, uh, you know, you can't win the race on the first lap here, but you sure as heck can lose it. And it look, look, looks exactly like what Max Wilson has done here and taken two cars, two other cars out of contention as well, two fast cars out of contention. And, you know, he, should, he shouldn't be trying to overtake people on the first lap, particularly at that sort of place. I mean, uh, I guess you, you, know, you can't see a heck of a lot because of the spray through there, but uh, he should have known how uh, dangerous the conditions were there. And you can't blame Herder for being a little bit conservative on the first lap through that part of the track and I believe that's Max Pappas that came through right behind them along with Mauricio Guzman and Michel Jourdain who both run over some nasty debris so they'll be pitting for sure yeah and here they are they're walking back and uh, Herder doesn't want anything to do with uh, Max Wilson I think he's uh, trying to get himself as far away from Dixon as he can there's Paul Tracy he's out of the race as well so there will be no repeat victory for the Canadian here at Road America Paul Tracy will be furious that's two races this weekend he's uh, been out of uh, the course of the go-kart race on Friday night. Here's the first lap where Servi and Franchini both put the power down coming out of five, didn't have any grip and tell you what, Dario was lucky to get out of that grass because it's very, very wet and slippery there, uh, but he was able to continue. Didn't really hurt him that much actually because he was starting at the back of the pack. And he has of course made that one pit stop where he topped off the fuel. But bad, bad news for his teammate Paul Tracy who was caught up in that incident with Max Wilson and Brian Herter. There you can see the debris all over the track there. This is certainly going to change fuel strategy too for today's race with yeah. these yellows. That's right. And uh, Frankie has come past both uh, Serbia and there's a replay again of uh, Wilson just running clear over the back of Herter's car. I mean, that was Tracy. Tracy was, Tracy was Tracy already was right off. behind him. I think he was right behind him, and he sort of moved to the right to try and avoid the accident that was happening. I would suggest in front of him, and he just had nowhere to go. As the two cars made contact, they came across and took out poor old poor Tracy. Uh, no question about it that he was the uh, innocent victim of that one. There's uh, Brian. Look how disappointed he is. Now what Brian does? Here it is again. 
The AC runs up the left rear. And I think that in the, in the gloom there behind is the, is the green and white car of Paul Tracy. And uh, he's right behind the two there. He elects to go to the right to try and get around him. And it turned out to be the wrong way to go. As look at that, he's launched right over the top of Herder. And uh, that's a pretty scary uh, accident for both drivers in that instance. It is because, particularly because right there is uh, the barrier, but there's a lot of trees in that area. And in the past here at Road America, we've seen cars clear those barriers and go into those trees. So Brian Herter and Paul Tracy make their way back. There's actually a shortcut if they take a right right there, and we'll be right back. So we saw Alex Tagliani make a move uh, for the lead and then go off a little bit wide at turn nine as they went into the carousel, almost lost the position to uh, Gilles de Ferran, uh, but they was able to get that one back, and now it is still Brack then leading over Tagliani, Gilles de Ferran, and Cristiano de Mada, as we are under yellow for that incident with Max Wilson and uh, Brian Herter, and which collected poor Tracy. Yeah, and Scott Dixon, he's obviously struggling for some reason on that first. That fell all the way back to seventh place. So uh, he'll be a bit, uh, don't know why that was, but uh, the track's getting pretty dry now. It's getting drier and drier the more laps they do. And uh, that's going to be fairly interesting as, uh, as soon as these guys get back to green again. We see that the Newman has pit appears to be waiting for Christian Filippaldi to make a pit stop. And yes, uh, here he comes. And that's the team called Green also waiting for Dario Franchitti and Bruno Junquero also onto the pit lane. They're actually checking out Christian's... Uh, uh, he's got damage. Christian Filippoli has damage to the left side pod right in front of the left rear wheel. And they check that out, but they send him back out and Dario comes back in. They're going to top him off again. Uh, obviously, he's saying it's too early to go to the slicks just yet because of all that standing water. I think uh, for, the, and, uh, for the water in pit lane too. But once you're out on the track, you can see it's fairly dry there, and there is a dry line. So it won't be long before they do come in and switch to the slicks. Yeah, but it's so slippery down at the bottom of the track there. Where we had that incident, though, I think it's going to be several laps yet before it's dry enough for them to come into sick tires. You know, the faster and being the only, uh, the sole supplier for this championship in terms of tires, they build a very conservative wet weather tire, so it's fairly hard, and it will not uh, give up uh, the tread as quickly as it would if it was a uh, softer tire, guy. So we are under yellow at Road America for the Road America 220. It's round 12, race 12, round 14 of the Cart FedEx Championship Series. Kenny Brack has uh, led, and this race has actually uh, only been won twice by what, someone leading every single lap. So we expect to see some lead changes. The two times it was won by leading every lap was Paul Tracy in 93 and Mario Andretti in 1987. Yeah, well, that's an interesting statistic, and uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, that shot from on high, watching the cars come down into turn five there, and some smoke again from two of the cars in particular, the two Patrick racing entries, that's uh, Toyota-powered Reynards of uh, Jimmy Vassa and Roberto Moreno, both showing a little bit of smoke, as we saw uh, on the pace laps before the start, that uh, it was Moreno's car was smoking, and Vassa's appears to be the same as the, uh, the cleanup continues down there at the exit of turn 11, the infamous kink here at Road America, that's uh, Archer... Archero Blair racing entry of Max Wilson being craned away and here the uh, Indec car the players uh, the sorry the Forsyth Championship racing entry of Brian Herter and that's going to get towed away and here it is again one more time through the mist you'll see to the right is Wilson and he just makes contact with that wheel of uh, Herter actually gets launched pretty well for Wilson and keeps going through the air and Paul Tracy had gone to the right so that to try and avoid the incident and unfortunately her to court back up with him and made contact with Paul Tracy and left suspension damage uh, to Paul Tracy. Here's Bruno Junquero, this is on the opening lap going into turn eight. Yeah, he started 10th of course, and then he had that impact there, he hit the side of Christian Filippaldi, he spun around, so he ended up the first lap uh, way back uh, in uh, 20th place, so uh, not a good start for Takagi, and we'd have to hope that there's no uh, uh, damage to the car of Christian Filippaldi. This is on Toro Takagi on his start, with the spins in front of him. 
This is a wheel spin there. He just uh, banging wheels there with one of the Patrick cars. That's Sir Roberto Moreno. And around he goes, and he's off into the gravel, right on the edge of the gravel, back across the track there, goes Tora Takagi. You could uh, just hear the wheel spin on that car there as he put that 850 horsepower down onto that very slippery racetrack. And that was in the carousel. I don't know if you noticed it, but from that video footage of the first incident there from Christian Fittipaldi, Paul Tracy, who had started back in 24th, had picked up a bunch of positions and was running up as high as uh, Servia, who, who started in 18th. So, tough, tough break for uh, Paul Tracy, and that's why he was up there running with Herter and Wilson, who had started 16th, well, Herter had started 16th, Wilson had started 19th, so Paul Tracy had had a great opening lap and helped with those incidents too. And here we are coming past, this will be eight laps now in the books uh, to be completed, and uh, what's interesting is in the pit lane, Christian Filippoldi is coming in again, and we'll look at this, when he comes to a rest, you'll see what we're going to be talking about, look at those, they're slick tyres that they're going to put on that uh, car of Christian Filippoldi, and there is the damage to the side pod, the rear, uh, the rear deflector there in front of that left rear wheel, they're trying to rip it off there so he doesn't fall off and uh, get tangled up in the rear tyre, maybe even cause a puncture, but that's going to lose him quite a lot of downforce and uh, in uh, you know when it's oh, wet that's not too bad but uh, if it's dry that's certainly going to be a fairly uh, significant disadvantage for Christian Filippoldi but a bold gamble here he is the first and only driver to select dry weather tyres interesting choice and again you're going to lose some of that downforce too and now he's got water all over those tyres as he exits pit lane but this will be interesting to see. He obviously feels confident enough that there's a dry line out there that he can find. And then maybe through that big mess of water at the back part of the track, he can find a drier way through there. It'll be interesting to see who else, if anyone else, comes in to change. Yeah, well, and so, you know, he's he's sort of become renowned as the rain master in this series, a really delicate touch to the steering wheel, and when it's, a, when it's slippery conditions, he is in his element, and that's certainly what he's going to have when he gets back to green. Well, we talked about it earlier, but Christian Filippoldi scored his first car career victory here at Road America. And this was in 1999 for the Newman Haas team. And of course, the Newman Haas team is like being at home here because the, the shop is just down in Chicago. Uh, but they had the local sponsors and the Kmart and the Havilah, and they had hundreds of fans and family and friends here. And it was a great win for Christian Filippoldi. It certainly was. And Carl Haas, uh, the co-owner, of course, with the actor Paul Newman, uh, he is, uh, he's been on the board of directors here at Road America for many years and uh, also the promoter here of this, this uh, Road America 220. Looking up pit lane further, we see that some other teams are now laid out, Jeremy, to make uh, tyre changes. Yeah, I think that's Guzman uh, I'm looking at there, that's uh, getting ready to change. Maybe even Max Pappas as well, looking a little bit farther on down the pit lane. There's a couple of other teams right, right down the far, and we can't really quite see who they are, but uh, we're going to go green this time, by. So if they come in now, when it goes green, they're going to lose a lot of track time by the time they get back out onto the racetrack. And uh, that's uh, going to be an interesting strategy if any Everybody comes in uh, uh, right now. Christian Filippoldi out in the carousel suddenly slowed down. Well, the reason he'll have done that is just to try and uh, build some speed up through the carousel, I think, perhaps, and just try and get a bit of temperature into those tyres before they go green. It's, uh, it's pretty cool here. It's about, what, 60, 65 degrees or so, so not, uh, not too hot. And uh, the track uh, temperature is fairly low as well. So the difficult bit now is to build some temperature into those tyres, and that's what you need. You need temperature so that uh, it sort of evaporates the moisture and you don't get the aquaplaning that you will do if it's wet. You saw Adrian Fernandez laid out there. He started 26, so he's got nothing to lose by pitting when we do go green. Fantastic aerial shot there of the Road America layout. You can see how big this place and how much room it takes up. And a superb track for uh, viewing and spectating. You walk all over the place. They rent golf carts here. A lot of people bring their uh, bicycles and scooters and go all over the track to watch at various different uh, locales, it's always good fun, and of course the cuisine here at Alcart Lake, Jeremy, is uh, absolutely delicious. I'm sure you've sampled an ear of corn this weekend. Well, I haven't actually sampled an ear of corn, but I certainly have sampled the bratwurst here. That to me is, that's, I love bratwurst, and particularly here at Road America, but the best track food in the country. All right, the pace car has pulled off into the pit lane. Kenny Brack will bring the field by through turn 14, and we'll go single file, green flag restart. Everyone's on wet weather tyres except Christian Fittipaldi on the slicks, and you can see Brack is already looking for water for the wet weathers. Down into turn one, no one close enough to make a move at this point. 
and we have a gaggle of cars, Guzman, Zanardi, Fernandez, and Bruno Junquera all on pit lane as they are coming in, and it looks like they are all going to change to wet weather to, uh, to dry weather tyres. Yes, they are, but as I said earlier on, they're going to lose a lot of track time here, so they really need, they're going to need a caution period, which of course is quite likely, uh, in order to catch up to the rear end of the field. In the meantime, if it, uh, if it doesn't go, if it does go yellow, then it'll be a, a gamble that will pay off for these guys. If it doesn't, then it won't. But uh, there goes Bruno Junqueira, slightly longer stop, I think, than some of the other guys. Oh, oh. there's Michael Andretti. Three-time winner here at Road America and a local favourite. Got it turned around in turn five. You can see that's been done before by a number of people over the weekend. Yeah, it is. That's a, a, a regular spinning place down there, and uh, a lot of uh, hospitality areas down there in turn five. So I think they'll have a great view of that. But in the meantime, Kenny Breck this time leading down to coming down into the carousel, and that's uh, Alex Tagliani in second place, Gilles, Gilles de Ferran in third, and Damada in fourth. Let's take a look again at uh, Michael Andretti. Did he get a little bit of help from Scott Dix? I think he did. It looked like he got a bit of a helping hand there. And just a little bit of contact the right front tyre of Dixon onto the left rear of Michael Andretti. Just unsettled that car and turn it around. And look, that's it's still very wet down there. And that's going to be oh so tricky for these guys, particularly those on slick tyres. You talk about grip level on these cars, Jeremy. Now, when they go through that water, the grip level, as far as the hands on the steering wheel, increases quite immensely, doesn't it? Yeah, certainly, yes. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, it's it's hard work, it's a very physical track here, not as physical nearly as uh, mid-Ohio, but it's certainly very, very tricky. You just have a delicate touch in these conditions, you've got to be oh so careful not to make a mistake. Look at that, Pratt goes off to the right, trying to find water along that pit wall where it hasn't dried. And then he'll weave back out to the left to set up for turn one. Tagliani follows him, everybody looking for that moisture on the right-hand side of the track because those wet weather tyres on a dry surface will go away in a hurry. Oh, Mauricio Guzman right underneath our camera post at the same spot that Herter and Wilson went off that water again. They see Zanardi come through. Yeah, and he was caught out by that water. As we said, that's what the dangerous place was going to be. And this is going to bring out a full course caution, almost certainly. We can see Jim Swinton actually readying the flags right now. And Gucci, you know, he's one of the most experienced drivers in the field. He was one of the few guys that you thought that perhaps wouldn't make a mistake at that location. But it's so slippery down there. Here is, look at that standing water there. And he, watch him coming through here. He goes, got 850 horsepower. And Rafa just snaps around and into the wall. Big contact on the left-hand side there for Mauricio. He's had enough of that for this year, I'm sure. Here it is on board once again. Riding with Mauricio Guzman through the kink. I'm sorry, through the carousel and then now through the kink. Now we're going to hit the water and listen to this. As the wheel, you'll hear the listen, wheel spin. Yeah, listening. Yeah, he's just aquaplane straight through there. Absolutely no grip whatsoever, and I think he was just trying to feather, feather the throttle and getting back on it again, coming out, out of that water, and he wasn't able to keep control. He's still in the car, though. Right now, he's a sitting duck, actually, yeah. as the field comes flying by. Uh, as they're going to be racing back to pit lane because we're going to go yellow, and we're going to get these guys. Max Wilson has made his way back to pit lane. It was in the area where there's a lot of water on the racetrack. What happened? I actually didn't see much what happened. I was behind Hertha, and then when we went through the spray, the last thing that I saw was already hitting him. I don't know, I think he had to step on the brake because somebody else broke in front of him. And then Trace came up behind and crashed on both of us, so it was a shame because the car was really good. So it was just Brian Hertha slowing, had nothing to do with Tracy? No, no, no. Tracy, I mean, he just hit on us and uh, he had to back off Hertha by some reason, I don't know exactly why. And uh, I couldn't say anything because of the water. And then I just saw and I was already on top of him. All right, we're glad you're okay. Paul? All right, everybody's made their way to pit lane. The Jill DeFerrin has gone in, but Elio Castroneves has stayed out. Patrick Carpentier has also stayed out. As Kenny Brack now goes to the slick tires. A little hard to get out of pit lane, which is still very wet. But we're under yellow. Jimmy Vassa has come in. Tagliani came in. Mimo Gidley came in, and there's a few others still staying out. Michael Andretti, and then Dario Franchini. So that's going to be Dario's third pit stop. And we're only uh, nine laps into this thing. Yeah, he was already at the back of the pack, so it'll just be a splash of fuel for Dario Franchini. He's already, uh, I think, on the dry weather tyres, isn't he? Did he stop? Uh, uh, did he? No, actually, they're going to change no. now and put the dryers on. I beg your pardon, he didn't change before. So there's Castro Neves, who's used this to give himself good track position. He yeah. comes from sixth up to first. 
Uh, but he's still on the wet weather tyres. Yes, he is. He and uh, Castroneves and uh, let's go down to the pits and pull traces. visibility like coming through that wall of water that crosses the track? Zero visibility. I mean, I came out of the uh, there were, out of that puddle and there was I couldn't see anything going into it. Came out and then I saw Max's car. He was on top of uh, Brian's and the track was all blocked and I was on the brakes and just nowhere to go. In your mind, should this race have gone green when it did with that water going across the backstretch? Well, it was a pretty big river, and I don't think it was really the right call. The rest of the track was okay, but that was a big river, and it was, uh, it was pretty deep. You're all right? Yeah, I'm okay. Tough luck continues for PT. I got yeah, I think, uh, I think Paul Tracy is right. I think... Uh, you know, they, they've started, I guess, uh, to keep the TV schedules uh, happy here, but uh, they probably should have been, would have been better advised to, to delay the start of this race for half an hour or so. But uh, I guess that's the, the pressure of television is why they didn't, because it was, the rest of the track was almost dry, but it was, it was so wet down there, and it was even wetter than we could really see from up here. It looked uh, as if it wasn't too bad, and I suggested that they should have started the race earlier. And uh, if I listened to Paul Tracy, I think clearly I was wrong, and there was too much water there. Here we are on board again now with Tori. Takagi, look at look at him. Look at that. And he's with it as well. He has joined Mauricio Guzman. He was yeah, he was completely off the throttle there, and uh, you know, just absolutely nothing you could do. You're in the lap of the gods, if the car comes out pointing in a straight way, straight line, you're in good shape, and that was the risk of switching on two slick tyres. And uh, I think uh, Cart perhaps has made a bit of a bit of a uh, bit of a faux pas here. They probably shouldn't have started that race, but uh, you know, it's the way television schedules work. And we're going to get out of Brian Herter in the pit lane. Elkhart. Tell us about this incident. Well, I mean, this, this incident shouldn't have happened at all, in my opinion, Gary. I mean, the, the water that was flowing across the track was, you know, too much. We were aquaplaning through there at 50 miles an hour, and I came out of the kink behind Kanan, and uh, right as he went into the spray, I saw him lift a little bit off the throttle, so I had to lift off the throttle, and Max must not have seen that from the spray, and just, you know, got in the back of me. It was unfortunately probably unavoidable for him, too, but uh, luckily everybody's all right. Are you you're okay physically here? I'm just pissed off. Understandable. Brian so, should tell us how he really feels. Yeah, well, you know, nothing's gone right for Brian Herder this year. He's uh, he's had a fast car at most of the races, and he's uh, really at a bit of a disadvantage here, just being a one-car team there with Forsyth Championship Racing. Doesn't have any uh, teammates to share information with, and uh, whereas in the past that's not too much of a difficulty, this year, with no testing allowed, it certainly it does put the single-car teams at a disadvantage. Yeah, the only guys allowed to test this year has been the rookies, and we mentioned that Bruno Junquera did 300 miles of testing here at Road America. Welcome back to Road America in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. It is round 14 of the Kart FedEx Championship Series. I'm Guy Hobbs alongside Jeremy Shaw. We are under yellow because it rained this morning, the track is dry, but there was one patch where, as Brian Herter described it, as basically a river running across it. And we've had Toro Takagi and Mauricio Guzman both go off, and they're both up against the, the wall there, uh, damaged and out of this race. We've got the whole field. You see the uh, pace, the uh, wrecker there at the back of the field. They're uh, going to uh, collect one of those cars and get out of the way. But we've got everybody now on slick tyres, except for Elio Castroneves and Patrick Carpentier. They are still on wet weather tyres, have not yet made a pit stop. Now, Patrick Carpentier and Alex Tagliani had a horrible season to start with. But in the last five races, they've done superbly well and collected 92 points. And here's a look at the last three with uh, the win and the podiums coming for the players' team. They've suddenly come on very strong. And now Tagliani and Carpentier also looking very good here at Road America this weekend. In a good run for those guys. But at the beginning of the season, I think we got, uh, it was at least Texas, uh, where they hadn't even made it to a pit stop. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think they scored one point between them from the first five races of the season. And since then, they've uh, gone extremely well. And Patrick Carpentier with a first, a second, a third in his last three races, and also a fifth place finish as well. He's moved his way all the way up to eighth in the points table now. And he's only, uh, what, 20 points or so out of third. So he's really had a great run here as Patrick Carpentier. And uh, Alex Tagliani, too. He's scored points in uh, the, each of the last uh, seven races. Races, six races, actually seven of the last eight, and he's up to 15th in the points. So uh, you met, and you mentioned that, Jeremy Tagliani. It, did, it took him until Milwaukee to get 
the first point for the players team and Carpentier didn't score points until he got to Detroit which was June. We yes. started in March. That's right. And uh, yeah, if the team players, I'm, I'm sure they were hoping that uh, the, uh, the race, uh, the race season hadn't started until June. If that would have been the case, then Patrick would be right up to the front of the order. There you see the field now. You can see the guys on the wet weather tires. They're the ones to the right on the pit, going along the pit wall. And the ones on the slicks all staying left, trying to get heat into those, but they need to be on their radios to their teams because we understand from race control that they're actually going to red flag this race to try and get that water problem. So Adrian Fernandez, there is the red flag flying right now. Adrian Fernandez is back in the pits, getting more fuel again. This is, I think, his third or fourth pit stop where they've been doing it because he's starting at the back. He can do this. He's not losing any track position. Scott Dixon is in the pits and they are working on the car. Yeah, he came into the pits, of course, before it went red. So uh, when it goes red, they're not allowed to work on the cars. They're just checking for that's, uh, Russell Cameron there, the team manager for the Pat West team, trying to get a, a clarification on the rules. Are they allowed to work on the car now or not? And there is the problem that we have here at Road America. That river, as uh, Brian Herder described it, just running across the track there. And it's uh, certainly subsided somewhat from where, it, from where it was not so long ago, but still a heck of a lot of water. And when you're on slick tires uh, running through there, even uh, on the part throttle you're still going to be doing a good 120 or 140 miles an hour through there and the road is kinked as well you're turning when you go through that water you have absolutely no control whatsoever oh, i see adrian fernandez's crew running up pit lane so adrian had a problem getting out of pit lane yeah he did he stalled the engine i'm not sure whether he stalled the engine or whether they just told him you know you don't need to go out because it is red now so when it's a red flag is out you're not supposed to leave the pits Ah, that's what they told him not to go out. Yes, you're right. So they're just bringing him back from pit lane. But where they will put him for the restart, I don't know, because he did actually cross the start-finish line. So I guess they're going to have to reset. It's going to be quite interesting when they reset the field now to find out where they're going to put him. Well, this is something we've seen before in Alcott Lake with rain coming into effect. Long delays. In fact, we have the longest race in the history of kart took place here at Road America. They came and did a few laps on the one scheduled weekend. The weather was so bad, they red flagged it and didn't have the restart until about two weeks later. Average speed there, Jeremy, was very slow. It wasn't very good, was it? No. Well, was it Jacques Villeneuve won that race, wasn't it, I think? In the Canadian tyre car, if I remember correctly. I believe so, yes. But there does go so, Fernandez, he's back into the action. And he does go out of pit lane, they do let him go, so he'll rejoin at the back. We'll find out where they start when we come back. The field has come around to pit lane and it's going to be a, quite a while apparently because they're going to sandbag off that area where the water is running across the track and that's going to take them a while. But this is, surely this has helped immensely Elio Castro Neves who didn't stop uh, when everybody else did to go to slicks which meant he inherited the lead. And now he's stopped and they're changing the tyres, so basically he's got a free pit stop out of this thing. Yes, he has, and uh, that's great news for him. He's had a fast car, he always has a fast car. He's actually been struggling a little bit this weekend. Uh, in all of the sessions, he hasn't really been able to match the pace of his teammate, Gilles de Ferran, of course, the defending uh, FedEx Series champion. But uh, Castroneves, when you give him the race lead, he's not going to relinquish it too easily. And once again, the great news for Patrick Carponche. He started way back in 12th, and uh, he too elected not to make a pit stop um, when uh, the, the when everybody else did so he uh, stayed out on wet you can see those wet weather tires as patrick is out of that number 32 car but he will restart second and again looking good to score a fifth consecutive podium finish for team players and a fourth personally for patrick carponche and there you see the simple green safety team going to work trying to dig some kind of a channel there to try and get that water to go off in a different direction as opposed to running across the track. You see Shinji Nakano and Michelle Jourdain out of their cars. Michelle yes, Jourdain, a lot of talk um, about Michelle again this weekend as to whether he will in fact be replaced at the Herdez Bettenhausen team and uh, I even heard to one point last night that uh, he could well be replaced before the end of this year. Yeah, there's certainly been talk of that because he had his, his best career finish uh, before this season here at Road America. He finished seventh here a couple of years ago driving for Dale Coyne's team. And certainly this year, 
Yeah, he's been a little bit disappointed. He's been fast on occasion, has Michel Jourdain Jr., notably in qualifying. They had a great race in Nazareth, punctuated there by a couple of spins. But uh, yeah, apart from that third place finish, a uh, career best, obviously, at Michigan International Speedway this uh, uh, a few weeks ago, he's been a little bit disappointing. And yeah, a lot of talk that they will replace him before season's end. The problem is, though, they're looking for, of, they would prefer a Mexican driver, but there really doesn't seem to be one coming up. No, there's a few in there's several in Indy Lights right now, and none really standing out as to, ready to move up into the Premier category, but uh, I've been told that uh, they're not uh, totally sold on it. It doesn't have to be a Mexican driver, in which case I think they're looking at people like uh, like Alex Barron, who has uh, r run well towards the end of last year for Dale Coyne's team, and he's uh, tested a couple of cars recently, and I know he's uh, in the frame if uh, Team Rahul decides to get rid of Max Pappas, and I gather that Max has a, a pretty watertight contract that they're having a hard time getting out of uh, to uh, so they need to honor that I believe in, other, in order not to go to court and have a fairly major settlement there so Max Pappis is staying in the car at least in the short term but I know Alex uh, has had some talks with the team and uh, they told him to you know stand by you know we may need your services at some stage in the future but I think the chance of Max Pappis staying at Rea Team Rahal next year uh, slim to nothing yes <laughs> I can say about as uh, good as my chances of a hole in one uh, also the the other big story there, of course, is the Kenny Brack, which we mentioned, but uh, making that switch for some serious money over to Chip Ganassi. Yeah, $5 million. Thank you very much indeed. That'll do quite nicely. Certainly Chip Ganassi, one of the uh, better funded teams uh, in the pit lane. And uh, I think also, as uh, Kenny said uh, earlier on, you know, the opportunity to go back to Indianapolis. He won that a couple of years ago with the AJ Foyt's team and love nothing better to go back there again and win it now for target Chip Ganassi Racing. Of course, Kenny uh, got some... Uh, NASCAR-like experience this year in the IROC series and uh, we could have been the first road racer to win it since Alan Sir Jr. Uh, but to, in the last race at Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago it was in fact Terry Labonte who won that uh, and won that IROC championship but I think uh, suddenly Kenny decided he kind of liked all that drafting and then uh, with a roof over his head and banging doors He's a very versatile driver, is Kenny Breck, and he's starred in just about anything. But, you know, we've had an action-packed day so far, have we, Guy, here at Road America? Of course, he won here in 1993 in the Barber Saab series, Kenny Breck, so he knows how to win at Elkhart Lake. And here is a look back at how today has gone with the rain coming down earlier. And they set the field out, and they had a single-file start after about five pace laps to try and dry the track out a little bit. Hmm. Here's Bruno Junquera in uh, turn seven, making Down. contact with Christian Filippaldi. Yeah, and another car, a couple of cars off behind him, and then we see this incident here between Dario Franchitti and Oriol Servia. They both spin there in unison, and then that big incident there, Max Pappis running clear over the back of Brian Herder's car and collecting Paul Tracy. Paul Tracy, an innocent victim there, and then Michael Andretti has a spin at turn five, but then gets it turned around. Then Mauricio Guzman aquaplaning across that water. Nasty contact with the wall. And then Toro Takagi did the same thing. And now here we are. This is the guy. These are the guys cleaning up while we are under red flag at Road America. Yeah, and I think uh, the officials really had no choice but to throw the red flag. Uh, that, there was just clearly too much water down there for safe conditions. The track was pretty much dry, the whole rest of the track. As you see the current uh, standings now with uh, Castronovas and Carpaccio, they're the only two who have yot not yet changed on two slick tyres. But Michel Jourdain Jr. running there in third place, he was one of the first to make a pit stop. We saw there the contact with for Mauricio Guzman with that outside retaining wall on the back stretch between turn 11 and 12. And Mauricio is now back in the pit lane area and we'll try and get a word with him. They're working is, on uh, Isoriel Servia's car, the Sigma Autosport team. Oh, say, did Servia stay in the car? Yes, he did. Everybody else, everybody else is out of the cars pretty much, but Servia stayed in his car. Yeah, so did some work on that car as well. Uh, you know, he was involved with a couple of Let's go to uh, the pit lane and Mauricio Guzman. Of course, was Mauricio Guzman. Now, you went to Slicks. You wish you hadn't done that now? No, the circuit was fine everywhere for Slicks, even before I took Slicks. The problem is we have a massive drainage problem after the kink, which is the fastest part of the track. And those are race cars, not power boats. You know, there is no way you can go through there unless if you follow other cars and they open the wake for you, you can get by. Since I pitted, the whole bunch was, the group was ahead of me. When I got there, the water had settled again. 
and the water is getting worse. I mean, we kept saying that before we took the start, it was just very irresponsible to even start the race. And Jill DeFerrin echoed those comments thinking they shouldn't have even started. Was it a situation where it got worse or it was just bad the whole time? was bad and actually got worse because the, the water is coming from, from the sides of the circle. It's not draining. And you get there, it's just like a glass. You are complaining with the tires and the, the, and the bottom of the car. It's just those guys had to sit in one of those cars and try to go through there. Well, we're glad you're okay. Thank you. Expensive way to find out, though, that it's not okay and uh, some damage to the car there. And, and obviously a complete disappointment after you spend three days at a racetrack getting ready for a race and then, then five or six laps into it. There's this big patch of basically, like he said, it's like a sheet of ice suddenly in the middle of the road. Yeah, and absolutely uncontrollable in those conditions. It was interesting what he said there about to, if you're following another car, it's not too bad because the, the car in front of you, as he said, channels a, makes a little bit of a channel for you, like sort of the parting of the Red Sea, and you can sort of follow it through there because just follow through the wheel tracks. But if you get off those wheel tracks, then you're in serious trouble. Or if there aren't any wheel tracks to follow, as Mauricio Guzman found out, serious problems there. And if you're just joining us and thinking that the track has suddenly sprung a leak from somewhere because, as you can see, it's nice and sunny and dry right there, it's not. It's what happened is we had an incredible storm came through, really, a front, a cell, and just dumped a ton of water and rain here this morning. And what is happening where we are on the pit straightaway uh, is probably... 80 feet higher than where you see these guys working and all the water is draining through the woods and through the Kettle Moraine area here which is where Elkhart Lake is situated all created by the uh, ice age years and years ago that's why we have so many lakes and things here but that's why we have the drainage problem and the water is running right across the track over at the back part between the, between the kink and Canada corner yeah, they're trying to dig that ditch there to sort of channel the water away and trying to shovel it back behind that concrete wall. That concrete wall almost acts like a sort of a dam and it's sort of, it, uh, the, the water flows around it. There's various you know, holes in that concrete wall. It flows through there and then collects against the concrete wall on the other side. So they're just trying to improve the drainage there. And look at the, you see the, the left-hand side pod there just uh, in front of that mechanic on the rear wheel. You can see they changed that damaged item there, that uh, flip up there in front of that rear wheel. They managed to change that under red flag conditions. That's great news for Christian. Filipaldi and he will be in sixth place uh, for the restart on slick tyres with a uh, fully uh, ho hopefully fully repaired race car. Yeah it's been a it's basically been a freebie uh, pit stop for Christian because he had that was damaged before if you're just joining us then they ripped it off uh, so he gets a, a free uh, pit stop and also Elio Castroneves and Patrick Carpentier, who were the only two who had not switched to slick tyres, they will do that under this red flag condition. And hopefully we're going to get a restart fairly soon here. We'll better set the running order for you because we're not exactly sure of the order they're going to send them out. Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, that's Paul Tracy's car there being uh, towed back uh, on the hook. And, uh, yeah, there'll be a lot of work on these cars, feverish activity on these cars. I'm sure most of the drivers started with uh, pretty much a full wet setup on the cars, or at least a, maybe a, an intermediate setup. Uh, what I mean by that is they'll probably have a little bit more angle in the wings and slightly softer suspension as well. But uh, now the track is almost completely dry. There's a lot of clouds around, but uh, apparently not too much chance of rain. It looks pretty dark over there, doesn't it? But uh, they are pre presuming there's not going to be too much more rain, in which case they're probably going to stiffen up the setup on these cars, maybe take it off a little bit a little bit of wing and certainly putting slightly stiffer shocks on there maybe even stiffer springs as well so the cars can just uh, take more uh, grip through the corners and to really maximize these drying conditions just purely speculation jeremy but what's the chances they could rush paul tracy's car back and do some repairs and get him going back out again uh, not great actually guy because he's about uh, unfortunately uh, good good thought but unfortunately the bad news is about uh, eight or ten laps behind now and uh, not really much chance of, of getting anywhere even even the last of the cars that went out of the race uh, when they, they spun off there and a kick in the wet so let's go down to yeah, Dario Frank in the pits. trying to endure a quite an adventure this one started out tough for you because you were right literally at the back <laughs> of this field so tell us about how it's gone for you thus far and, and what your crew is trying to make it better for you well, I've had two pit stops and uh, a spin, or, or I tapped into a spin so far, so it's been pretty exciting. Um, nah, it's, it's, it's one of the most, the most strange races I've ever, ever been involved with ever, you know, running around there, most of the track, in fact, 95% is dry, there's one horrendous puddle, maybe two inches deep down at, um, just after the kink there, so that's, that's our biggest problem. But the thing that's really upset me just now is that the three guys uh, out, up front are now changing from uh, wet tyres to slicks, they're getting a freebie, basically. Everybody else lost track position by coming in to change tyres, and these guys are heading out there without... Uh, without losing any position, it's, it's not very fair. 
is there anything that you can gain in terms of an advantage in making a change in your car? Oh, we're making some changes, yeah, um, to make it more towards a dry setup, but uh, you know, we haven't quite got the advantage that those guys have got, I think. Thanks, Dario. Jan? Hey, you see, you hear Dario talking about that freebie pit stop. It really has played into the hands of uh, uh, Elio Castro Neves and Patrick Carpentier at this point because they were the only two who did not stop under the yellow and changed to the slicks. They stayed out, and uh, I don't quite sure how, what they were thinking. I guess they just were guessing there was going to be another yellow fairly soon, but it's well, certainly played into their hands. Well, they're knowing, yeah, particularly as the Guzmi was saying, if you're leading the pack, then it's really tricky. If you're following somebody else through that through, through that, uh, that standing water down there by the king, it's not too bad. But if you're leading the way, then uh, it's pretty dodgy. And, you know, it's very wet down. It's so easy to make a mistake. And Castro Nevers, he wants to make sure he scores as many points as he can. So he was going to stay out there and hopefully, uh, you know, take advantage of it. But again, look how much water there is there. The rest of the track almost completely dry and not so there in that very, very dangerous and you, one of the fastest parts of the track. And you, it, you can see on from that video there, Kenny Brack was the first one through and it just showed exactly what uh, Mauricio was talking about. He came through and was uh, really, really wobbly and then the cars that came behind him were actually fairly solid they followed right through his wake yes they did you can see as you say from kenny's car just the water splashing out to the side and uh, all that work going down there they've got the jet, jet dryer down there to try and dry off that track and uh, get that water out of the way and hopefully we'll be get uh, back underway here before too lo much longer so hopefully we'll get the jet dryer going and we'll get back the drivers are getting into their cars so we are looking forward to a restart pretty soon An aerial view there of the pit lane and the paddock area, which is uh, fairly new. It's about three or four years old, this uh, brand new paddock at Road America. And it's a fantastic layout, actually, here. But uh, quite a long slog, good old uh, slog around here to get your way around. Yeah, a lot of the fans have uh, made their way into the area behind the pit stalls there, just watching this fever of feverish activity going on there as the cars uh, are changed over from uh, at least a semi-wet setup to a full dry setup and getting ready for the restart of this race. And you see Paul Tracy's car that is still in the kiddie litter. I don't know why they haven't moved that. It's certainly it was on the hook a while ago, wasn't it? I'm quite it sure why they didn't uh, bring it all the way back to the pits. There's a Oriole survey there with Dario Franchitti comparing notes and having a a uh, bit of a talk there probably about the conditions there. The Oriole expressing his uh, uh, thoughts on the way the, tra the, ha the track was before we had this red flag. It's quite interesting. Yesterday in the qualifying, we had Kenny Brack and Alec, uh, uh, Alex Tagliani, and we had the French Canadian, a Swede, and I believe we had a uh, New Zealander in there too. So it's quite an interesting press conference as everyone interpreted how their qualifying went. So there you see again the four-mile facility that is known as Road America and Highway 67 that runs by it to the right. You can jump on that and get onto Highway 57. You can go to Kiel or you can go the other way and end up down in Milwaukee. And why is it you want to go to Kiel? You wouldn't want to go to Kiel. <laughs> but uh, one of the big things they're Bratwurst, of course, here is the... They're just, uh, it's good. Just waiting now for the command to get back in the car. Uh, you're the race leader, so what's your perspective? It may be a whole lot different from what we've been hearing from these other guys. Well, I, I believe so. Uh, we just have to uh, be strong, keep in shape right now. We don't know what's going to happen down in the back street. It was really bad. That's why uh, we didn't pit, but uh, actually we have a lack of communication in the radio. So, uh, hey, sometimes... Has that been fixed? Uh, uh, yeah, so far now it's been fixed. So uh, everything, uh, it's under control. We just have to go, go for it. Don't waste any time. Now, you've got slicks on the cars you came in here, and you're going to go back out there, and you know how wet it's been down there outside beyond the kink. How much does that concern you, and what will be your approach as you lead this field down there? Well, as going as going the, the first one, I mean, I think it's better because you have a clear vision, so you know where you can go. At least that's, uh, that's what I felt on the, on the, the lap before, but uh, I, I, no concern. It's just make sure that we stay on the gray side and not on the green side. <laughs> He, he always finds a way to put a spin out with a smile, Paul. Uh, hopefully not a spin and spin as in Guzman or Takagi. There you see Elio's car. So basically, Jeremy, what we've got now is a, a brand new race because they've changed all the setups on the car. They've changed all the tyres on the cars. They've all refueled under this red flag situation. And now, instead of having the uh, Road America 220, we're basically going to have 
what is going to be a 41 lap race. Elio Castro Neves now our pole sitter with Patrick Carpentier alongside him, Michel Jourdain, Kenny Brack, Shinji Nakano, then it's Tagliani, Gilles de Ferran, Mimo Gidley, Cristiano de Mada, Jimmy Vassa, Max Pappis, Roberto Moreno, Tony Canan and Alex Zanardi, and then 15th is Junquera, 16th is Servia, Michael Andretti, 17th, he had a spin on the original start, Dario Franchitti who went off and was very uh, fortunate to get back on, uh, will be in 18th, he started the original race, back in 25th and he has already made four pit stops to keep topping off on fuel and all all that strategy for him of course has now gone out the window too yeah that's true and th this man here uh, adrian fernando so that's his car at least he's made five pit stops so far including a long one right before or right as this red flag was called but uh, he's getting ready uh, to go there and uh, the uh that team has been struggling a little bit this weekend. Uh, they've been, uh, they've had quite a lot of mechanical problems actually, but he's also been quite fast. Uh, Adrian was in the top four or five on the Saturday morning session, and unfortunately in qualifying, he ran off the road on his first lap out, so he didn't get a chance uh, to uh, get back and set a representative time. And the team elected not to switch to the backup car at that stage. It was a wet session and it was drying out, and they really figured there wasn't much point in taking that car out because if they'd if they'd done that, they would have had to have withdrawn drawn this car from competition and that would mean that if they had any sort of problem they went out again in a backup car and crashed that then they would have been in trouble now we've uh, talked about him quite a bit this year but the new chief steward taking over from wally dollenbach is chris nifel and uh, we were hoping to hear from chris but i will check in with him in a, in a few moments he's actually standing basically right behind us jeremy and um, we're just going to try and get a, a word with him on it on the decision on this uh, red flag here. He's had a lot of decisions to make recently as Chris Neifel and he's certainly going to, to come in for some criticism, criticism I think from the drivers for getting this race underway this afternoon in what were clearly very tre treacherous conditions in, indeed and uh, you know it looked uh, didn't look too bad from where we were and where from where Chris was here in race con control but uh, the pace car was out there leading the cars around and uh, one would have presumed that there was a an experienced uh, driver at the wheel of that car. Don't actually know who was driving the pace car who is driving the pace car this weekend but generally speaking Wally Dallenbacher generally goes out there uh, with whoever is otherwise driving the pace car and I think they should have realized how deep that water was and how dangerous it would have been for this drivers and you know we've got a red flag now and it would have been a lot uh, better idea obviously hindsight being 2020 to have this delay before we got the race underway uh, at all I seem to remember we had a long long red flag delay here at Road America about 1991, I believe it was, when A.J. Foyt had gone off at turn one and uh, went, uh, I think it was before that, it didn't really have a sand trap there and it basically sort of disappeared off towards Plymouth somewhere and it took a long time to get him out of the car and uh, we had a, a red flag situation here. Yeah, that was a very nasty crash, wasn't it? Uh, bad injuries to uh, the uh, feet and lower legs of A.J. Foyt and uh, pretty much the end of his career, really, in ultimate terms. Of course, he's now a successful team owner in the Indy Racing League and that's where Kenny Breck came through. He drove with A.J. Foyt and he won a championship for Foyt and also the Indianapolis 500 as well. But uh, here we can see uh, the clean-up process still going on there, down. That's at the exit of the kink, the exit of turn 11. And you can see them with those brooms there. You see how much water there is right up against the wall. You know, since that incident, is, that's when they added the gravel trap here at one. And they've now, in fact, added gravel traps at a number of spots around the track here. And they were hoping that would... Uh, a stop the impact and stop the crashes but unfortunately what it's done is create more red flags and yellow flags here at road america because they go into those gravel traps and then the car has to be retrieved from there and they have the um cranes that uh, turns one three six and twelve to do that to get those cars out but unfortunately to get those little cranes out to get the car out means you've got to go for a long-term yellow yeah that's true but the, the good news is uh, with those cranes the 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 red flag in or they should say the yellow flag interruptions tend to be fairly quick they're only even just one lap or so before they can go back to green again it's a great shot there of uh, patrick carponche and as we said earlier on he's really on a roll right now and no points at all from the first six races and 65 points in the last uh, seven events here and that's moving him all the way up to eighth in the points and uh, Patrick Carpentier, he's the hot man at the moment. He's the guy on the charge. He scored more points than anybody else in the last uh, three races, certainly, and really moved himself up into contention for this championship. Another interesting thing about Patrick Carpentier is he has, as you say, scored the most points in the last five races with 50. However, 
he overall over the whole season he has completed the least laps uh, of anybody and that is he is only at 66 percent uh, and on the other end of the scale is scott dixon who has scored points in eight of the last 10 races he has completed 1,666 laps of the 1,734 that have been run. And Carpentier is actually 500 laps behind him. Now, we talked about that gravel trap and AJ Foyt going off. Well, Patrick Carpentier, once they put the travel car trap in, found out a different way to go through there. Yeah, certainly a lot safer here. He has a locks up the brakes and watch this action he goes tumbling over and over and over and over and uh, that sand trap certainly there did its job it slowed that car down considerably and it was certainly a, a pretty uh, frightening looking crash but patrick was able to get out of that car without a scratch just a little bit of a shake here and there but there you go. that's that gravel trap that they have added here since that aj foyt incident i think we took that picture actually right when he got out of the car it looked like <laughs> he's had a bit of a shock there actually that's the way that's what he that's what patrick looked like when he came along to spring training at the beginning of this year sort of a it was a photo opportunity down at california speedway and uh, he he came up here with the, the modern look and uh, it might be it's coming back to haunt him because now he's got a much more sensible let's say a much, much more traditional i probably should say a hairstyle now and without the goatee as well and uh, he's, uh, he's carrying that picture now with him for the whole rest of the season. We're not going to let him forget that in a hurry. No, but he, he has been campaigning, actually, to get his photo retaken. But we're not going to let him. <laughs> there's, there's finally, there's Paul Tracy's car with uh, the bib underneath it, and that's going to be uh, hauled back here. And, uh, and some of the campsites, a lot of people camping out at this racetrack. Make a, really make a weekend out of it. Not the best of weekends weather-wise for camping, though, here. My idea of camping is checking in and getting a nice room key <laughs> yes absolutely right but there uh, is a good look again at the uh, nationality as a cosmopolitan nature of this fedex championship series there the uh, the uh, flag of uh, scotland there for dario franchitti and uh, a colorful scene in the pit lane as uh, cars now not so much feverish activity now i think everybody's finished their setup changes on the cars and they're just waiting to get this race back underway talk about the nationalities because they have the nation's cup in this uh, series and i believe right now brazil is leading yeah. that comfortable lead there for team brazil and they they won the championship last year uh, team america team usa won that uh, series for the first uh, what four years i think of its existence but now the brazilians taking a stranglehold they won it last year and comfortably out in front right now so when we do get this thing restarted elio castro neves will be our leader and here's a look at uh, his kart career it's been pretty successful started of course with the late carl hogan who unfortunately uh, passed away uh, earlier this year um, but then he, he was quickly spotted and then signed up uh, with uh, Roger Penske and, and uh, just one week ago he had a great run of course uh, racing mainly against his teammate Gilles Deferrin but they raced at uh, mid-Ohio and a strategic pit stop by Elio Castro Neves was able to him to have a good run and this is just one week ago. Yeah, that uh, Marlborough team Penske, they've been dominant to that track now the last couple of years. They've absolutely uh, led every lap there. And uh, they've, well, not actually led every, every lap this time because Oriol Servia had some time out in front. But at the end of the day, it was Elio Castroneves, Spider-Man, climbing the fence once again. His trademark style, what a character this boy is. What a great drive that was, was just one week ago. Have you bought one of the uh, T-shirts yet, Jeremy? The T-shirts all available all over the place that say, I climbed the fence with uh, Spider-Man. <laughs> and uh, I haven't bought mine yet. He did that in, uh, his win came in a uh, Honda Reynard. And uh, we're just taking a look at the, because we talked about the Nation Cup, we have the manufacturers battle as well. And uh, so far, Reynard have seven wins and Lola have five wins. And the Honda have five wins, Ford have five wins, and Toyota have two wins. But their wins have come uh, on one road course and one oval. But the five wins for Honda have all been on either road or street courses. Yeah, and there's a field summary there. You see those cars out of the race, all uh, all involved in, in incidents down there at uh, the exit of Turn 11, the infamous kink here, that first one where Wilson climbed over the back of Brian Herder's car and also took out Paul Tracy. And then the two separate spins there when they were out on slick tyres, Mauricio Guzman and Toro Takagi, both spinning off the road and collecting the wall. They are all out of the race. Lights actually are, did appear to be out, but... Uh, I think we're probably going to do one more lap before we get back to green flag conditions and the drivers now will be able to check out there they are coming through that uh, section of the track there where the war standing water was it looks uh, a heck of a lot better now and no spray uh, we can see at that part of the track is so uh, pretty much dry all the way around 
So we've gone from the Road America 220 to what is going to be the Road America 160, basically, because uh, the lap as they go around, we, uh, they have completed 14 of the 55 laps. So we're on lap 41 right now as the pace car takes the field around. And you heard about the freebie, just in case you missed it, Elio Castroneves and Patrick Carpentier were the only two who had not changed the slick tyres. Uh, but they have now done so in that red flag situation, so they've uh, basically got away, they've had a free pit stop, and that's really going to help them. Yeah, and uh, the, this will be uh, still be two hours of green flag racing, that is the cart rules, as uh, Jim Swintall holds up one finger with the yellow flags out there, so we have one more lap before we go back, back to green, and it'll be an hour and 13 minutes to go, or uh, 41 laps, whichever comes first. It's actually done wonders for the concession stands here at uh, Road America, because they went red at about 1.10, which is the perfect time to go and get yourself a bratwurst and an ear of corn. Yeah, you're on your way, you bring, bring me one back as well. well I was planning on getting one at about 2.10, but obviously that's <laughs> not going to be happening today. It won't be too far away, as I say. An, an hour and 13 minutes, so we'll do, they will do uh, under green uh, flag conditions here. And uh, depending on the track condition, that'll be about a 1 minute 40 second lap times 41 is, what, 40 minutes and... Uh, You're asking the wrong guy. It's a bit over... Yeah, they're going to be struggling to get 41 laps in, but it'll be fairly close, particularly if it goes dry, uh, goes uh, green all the way and stays dry. And it's certainly looking as if that would be the case. One hour, 37 minutes was the race time last year, but because they went no yellows <laughs> last year. So there is how they will start. Castro Neves and Carpentier up front with that freebie pit stop. Michel Jourdain, third. He had a third place finish already once this year. Kenny Brack, who originally started on the pole, will run fourth. And then Shinji Nakano, Christian Fittipaldi and Alex Tagliani. And further back, you see there, Oriol Servia, Michael Andretti. And the rest of the field, Dario Franchitti is going to have his work cut out. But they've made changes to the car now in that red flag. They've gone to the dry setup. And uh, he was he was about sixth or seventh quickest on Friday in the dry and then had problems in qualifying yesterday when he went off at turn 12. As the field makes its way around and through the trouble spot and back up to turn 14. The pace car makes its way around again as the field now this time trying to get heat into the tyres. Of course they were on wet weather tyres when we first started working through turns at seven, eight, and now into the carousel. And now out of the carousel is where that trouble spot was with all the rain, looking back from Bruno Junqueira's car. Yeah, he's uh, now running in 16th place, of course. He started uh, in 10th, he made up a couple of places, but he threw it all away with a spin uh, right here, actually, at turn eight. So he's way back now in 16th, uh, but uh, he, like everybody else, is on slick tyres. The track now appears to be uh, completely dry all the way around watching the cars there. that's that vantage point there down you can see that's the kick they're heading into the kick with that curbing on the left hand side and you just got to commit yourself to turn right there blind corner and you use up all the road at about 160 miles an hour still gathering speed as you uh, reach the terminal velocity before breaking for turn 12 and this was a trouble area that we had earlier on but as you can see now it seems to be absolutely dry and there should be no dramas at least from that point of view when we get restarted and again, out of the race, Paul Tracy, Max Wilson, Brian Herter, Mauricio Guzman, and Toro Takagi. Those last two having trouble, well, actually everyone having their the incident in that one area. And Paul Tracy, unfortunately, the complete innocent victim getting collected by the Wilson and Herter. Oh, well, Brian Herter also basically innocent of anything, but getting run into. So they will not get the restart, which Elio Castro Levers will lead, Nevers will lead us to as he works his way through turn 14. He's going to catch the pace car if he goes too quick. Pace car is off into pit lane. Once again, Jim Swintar cannot see the cars until right then. As they come up underneath the bridge and it gives the green flag. Yeah, tag, tag the on is right close, but they got a good draft there. Will he pull out? He will pull out, but Castroneves keeps the inside line. Tagliani on the outside, can't make that move. A great reside by Tagliani, but a good move there from Castroneves to defend that advantage guy. And Jordan sticks in there, just uh, it's Carpentier and that's uh, Tagliani further back you saw, but Carpentier with that great start, but Jordan now right underneath his wing as they race down to turn five. 
Yeah, all sorts of battling for position there farther down the field. And once again, that's Jourdain trying to make a move and getting past, apparently, uh, tagged uh, Carponche, I should say. But uh, Carponche fights back on the inside as Christian Filippaldi makes a move on Kenny Breck for fourth. Nice uh, outbreaking manoeuvre coming into five. That's where you're going to see a lot of overtaking. You also see a lot of overtaking here, right here, where Jourdain makes the effort on the inside of six. Oh, and it almost puts Carponche off, and that gives Christian Filippaldi, and he jumps all over that chance, and he picks up the position. Great move. Moved by Michel Jourdain Jr. there to take over second place from Carponche. And Carponche now, he lost that place, as you said, to Christian Filippaldi. And Kenny Breck can now make the challenge. Can they get past the inside of the carousel? No, he can't. And here comes Tagliani on the outside in the carousel. Now, this is a brave move because there's no grip out there. He gets by Brack and they're going to go into the kink side by side. No, Carpentier lets him have it. Wow, that's a great move by Alex Tagliani. That is a very brave move indeed. And now we can see Jourdain making the move on Castro Nevers. He's really putting some pressure on the leader. Oh no, Tags almost loses it going through Dove, kind of the corner. And Carpentier goes off. Oh, these two don't need to be making contact with each other and taking each other out, that's for sure. Yeah, there'll be some words there, I think, uh, between those two, which we see Memo Gidley there trying to make a move as well. And boy, what a lot of action on this first lap of the restart. Castro Neves comes by, Michel Jourdain right underneath him. And then Christian Fittipaldi, who picked up third. And now it's Carpontier who runs fourth rack. There's Gilles de Ferrin. There's Primo Gidley there holding off Tagliani, but Tagliani off the road, and there's the race leader, Elio Castro Neves with Michel Jourdain Jr. tucking in behind in second place. Great new side he made there. Great move at the top of the hill to get past uh, Kenny Breck, and the Kenny Breck now follows in fifth position behind Christian Fittipaldi. I think Michel Jourdain must have been listening uh, during that red flag, Jeremy, when we were talking about the contract negotiation maybe going on. Here we've got to move down the inside, this time it's uh, Max Pappis down the inside of Jimmy Vassar in five, but now Vassar's going to come back right at him. Oh, Pappis makes the move and blocks the move because Jimmy could have had a run up the hill and had the inside line right we saw with Jordan earlier, but Max uh, came over and actually that was a major blocking effort going on there. Yeah, it was, he moved from one side of the track to the other, there was nowhere through there for Jimmy Vassar to get that position back, but a good dive, so that's a battle for 10th and 11th places, and Max Pappis, having started at the back of the pack, now on a bit of a charge, and he too is fighting for his job, so he's got himself up now in the top 10, and we'll be looking to make even more moves than that. 38 laps remain here at Road America, that's the kink. Is very fast and definite. Close your eyes and hang on and put your foot to the floor through there. There's Tony Kanan under pressure there from one of the Patrick cars and he's able to hold it off. And he's actually trying to pass the other. That's Jimmy Vassar, Kanan and uh, Roberto Moreno batting. There is uh, Alex Tagliani, uh, sorry, Alex Zanardi leading, leading that other group of cars. Oriol Servia right behind him and Dario Franchini. Yeah, he just uh, overtook Servia through uh, kind of the corner. Franchini would now like to do the same through turn 14 and up the hill as they race. Back down the long, long straightaway here at Road America into turn one. Also a great overtaking opportunity. Further back there you see the matter. He's moving over and blocking that inside line against Bruno Junqueira. On board with Mimo Gidley. There through turn three. Now again another long, fast run down to turn five. Up to 200 miles per hour here. Now watch Gidley and you're waiting. To the right, you'll see the yardage markers, and wait till the one yard or 100 yard marker, then it's full on the brake. There you go, found three gears, four gears in fact. Quite a lot of fuel on board there, so breaking a little bit earlier than they would have done certainly in qualifying trim up the hill there to turn six, the left-hander here, and Gidley, you see the car just slides out there towards the exit of the corner, now right-handed again, going downhill here through turn seven there, up one gear, up to uh, fifth gear, I think down a couple there, third gear for the left-hander at the bottom of the hill. Just a quick note, uh, Sinji Nakano, he took the restart in fifth place, he's already fallen to the very back of the pack, the 21st place, that didn't take long. Yeah, not a good day for Sinji. 
Tonardi, who qualified so terrible, uh, is now running in 14th, but there you can see problems for him. The wicker bill uh, has slid out of the rear wing there. I mean, it's not going to affect him that much, but he's going to lose a bit of the downforce that he's hoping for to get through those turns, but uh, it's going to help him down the uh, front and middle straight here. Yeah, he's just going to hope he doesn't get black flag. We see somebody, ooh, somebody trying to make a move. I think it was on Adrian Fernandez right behind those two. In the first... Uh, smoking brakes. I don't know whether they were make, able to make the pass behind uh, him was Scott Dixon on the previous time around. It looks like it's bent pretty good, it? so it doesn't look like it's going to come out any further. Uh, Jim Swintal does not have a black flag in his hand as Zanardi approaches the start finish line, and there is no black flag there, so they're going to let him continue. But of course, it may have yet to be reported in further detail, so we'll wait and see. Of course, Zanardi uh, very upset with the results at middle high. Oh! Uh, a chop there, and uh, that was Tagliani trying to make a move on Memo Gidley. That's a battle for eighth and ninth, and uh, close behind them, we see Kenny Brett coming through, Gilles de Ferran, and then uh, Cristiano de Mada. De Mada now in the seventh place behind de Mada. There is Memo Gidley. Just to go back on that Zanardi issue, he was black flagged at mid-Ohio. Uh, he for overtaking Christian Filippoldi under yellow. He let Christian Filippoldi back by him, and he thought that would be okay, and he didn't. But he didn't come in and. Uh, pay his penalty to the black flag, so they just stopped scoring him. That's right. Alex was pretty unhappy about that. Yeah, but uh, you know, the rules are you're told that, well, and McGinley there slides wide. He got a bit too close to the back end of Damada's car, lost a lot of momentum there, but uh, it appears he's able to hold on ahead of Tagliani, unless we see Tagliani trying the outside line again. No sign of that, so Gidley comes out, he maintains that position, but did lose quite a lot of ground. But back to that uh, Tanadi thing, they gave him, they told him for several laps what he'd done wrong, and they gave him the opportunity to redress the balance, and he didn't do anything about it, so then they showed him the black flag, and then Zanardi uh, decided to let, uh, let uh, Fittipaldi back through, but by then it was too late, the damage was done, and he had his opportunities to make to redress the balance, didn't do so, so then uh, that, it was bad news from there on out, and uh, he fell from ninth place down to 19th, he said he wasn't very happy, but it was certainly a mistake from Alex uh, Zanardi. That cost him some points there. Uh, which is what he was mostly annoyed about. And look, Ashton Nevers opened up a little bit of a gap now over Michel Jourdain and Christian Fittipaldi. Tagliani, I thought, would have been a lot closer to Gidley after Gidley went in too, uh, too deep and almost ran into the back uh, of the matter. But Tagliani must have uh, had a bit of a whoopsie himself because he's dropped just back just a little bit. Yeah, and uh, Gidley's actually close right back onto uh, the tail of the matter again. So he's obviously got a pretty quick car, I think, as Memo Gidley. And uh, there we see that wicker bill there, just uh, this is sort of an opening in the back end of the wing plate there. They can slide that wicker bill in. And if they want to get a bit more downforce, a little bit less downforce, they can open it up, open a little gate there, slide it out and slip another one in there. It just takes a few seconds during a pit stop. Clearly someone forgot to close that, that, uh, that uh, clip there. And then it is falling out. And he's just got to hope that uh, he doesn't get a black flag again. So he'll have to come in. It's up to the officials to decide whether there is any danger of that wicker bill falling out and then being uh, collected by another car. And it's, a, it's just a little bit of an aluminum there, aluminium, depending on which side of the Atlantic you come from. And oh, Michael Andretti has the same problem. I was wondering why he was falling back. He'd fallen back uh, several places. He's actually running in 20th and clearly struggling with that car. He's fallen back from the tail of a battle between uh, Fernandez, Dixon, and Junquera. And uh, Michael Andretti is not having the afternoon he expected. I see Jim Swintal is looking at the monitor and I think he's reaching into his box of flags as we speak. So we'll see as Elio Cashinevers again adds a little bit to his lead over Michel Jourdain. Yeah, still doing a great job in it, holding on there in second place with Christian Fittipaldi behind him. This uh, track is dry now. Jordan hasn't been Ooh. close with Jimmy Vassar. Yet more problems for Jimmy Vassar. Incredible sequence of bad luck. No, oh, big crash here. That wow. is One of going under the motor roller bridge. And that is... Exactly. One of the target cars, certainly. I think it's uh, Gidley. He hasn't come past here, so uh, we've got to presume it's uh, Memo Gidley. And uh, that car is a very tricky corner. That's a very fast corner coming out underneath the bridge. And uh, he was dicing, of course, with Cristiano de Mata. He's off the road and upside down. And that's uh, turn 13 as they come out from Canada to turn 13, looking backwards and, from turn 14. And Dixon has just come into the pits as well, minus his rear wing. Whoa, look at that tie marks into that concrete wall there. That is a huge crash, and I think Vassar is obviously all part of that, but Vassar further back. 
Yeah, Vass has stopped. He stopped at the kink, I think, or just after the kink on the back straight. So I uh, don't think he was anything to do with that. Hard to know what happened to Memo Gidley. But finally, the safety team arrives. Seems to have taken a long time to get there. And uh, they're going to dig underneath that car and uh, get Memo out of there. And uh, you see the this yellow flags being waved behind. And uh, it is a full course caution. This is... Um this is where Paul Tracy had a huge impact a uh, number of years ago. Almost ran into a camper parked down there. Uh, but uh, Mimo obviously made heavy contact with the <laughs> Scott Dixon without that win. He makes his way back around, but we are under yellow here. And this means Zanardi and Andretti will be able to come in and address their wicker bill problems. But it is Elio Castro Neves in his Honda that leads at Road America. Welcome back, uh, particularly to all our Eurosport viewers, to Road America in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. It is round 14 of the Kart FedEx Championship Series. We are under yellow, and Mimo Gidley has had a very nasty accident at turn 13. Uh, we're not sure if Scott Dixon was involved, but he is missing his rear wing. And Jimmy Bass's car is that little orange uh, speck you can see there. Uh, somehow probably involved also in this incident, but he's much further back. And you can see Gidley has gone through and rolled over and obviously hit that abutment, the, the bridge there. Yeah, that would be a big impact there. And there's the concrete wall there. There's not much, uh, well, there's no runoff there at all before you hit that bridge abutment. But those three cars, uh, Fassa, Gidley and Dixon, were well spaced apart in the running order before that uh, chain of events so it's uh, tough to know what happened but uh, certainly you can see that uh, Vassa has stopped by the side of the track and uh, Gidley had been running uh, in uh, eighth place before that incident there's the overhead view of turn 13 where the incident involving Mimo Gidley has taken place uh, Jimmy Vassa and Scott Dixon we also believed involved in that and we are checking on those, but uh, Jimmy has pulled off to the side here. Jimmy had, a, had has had a run of bad luck recently. And strange that incident, you can see this is from, from the overhead uh, before there, you can see uh, that uh, he seemed to just spear off the road before the corner, pretty much. He really hadn't, hadn't turned before you saw those black marks. That uh, car there, upside down still. Yeah, a lot of damage to that car and uh, there'll be safety teams will be down there uh, with Mamo. but uh, look, certainly a, a very odd looking accident uh, we don't really obviously no way of knowing what happened there isn't, there isn't a camera at that point going into that corner i don't believe but he seemed to sort of just spear off the road without making that turn at all and then just a heavy heavy impact into the tires a car turned over and flipped around and uh, certainly our uh, our thoughts now with uh, with Maymo and hoping that he's going to be okay. The safety team is down there. They are the best in the business, these guys. Uh, there is uh, surgeons uh, that work with this team, uh, with the safety team, uh, on a full-time basis. And they will be down there and uh, making sure that the situation is stabilized before they get Maymo out of that car. There you see the workers. This is looking back from turn 14. Back to... The, uh, what is actually, it's called the Billy Mitchell Bridge, Billy Mitchell Bridge, and that's basically the way everybody gets to the infield from uh, outside of the racetrack here at Road America. And as mentioned before, Paul Tracy had a nasty accident there, but it was after the bridge, but this one looks like it's actually involved the bridge. So 21 laps have been uh, run here, mainly under yellow today. We had the red flag, we have 33 laps left. Elio Castro Neves is our leader. Michel Jourdain runs in second. Christian Fidipaldi, with some great moves, is up to third. And Patrick Carpentier runs in fourth. Kenny Brack in fifth. Gilles de Ferran is in sixth. Cristiano de Mata in seventh. Tagliani in eighth. He's been uh, running when he was in, uh, battling at that point with Mimo. And in ninth, it's Max Pappas tenth. Roberto Moreno. That's uh, Dave Higuera there, the uh, crew chief uh, for uh, Mamo Gidley's car. There is the safety team there uh, down at work uh, on that car, the number 12 car, the target car. It's a Lola chassis Toyota power plant. And again, a very strange looking impact there. You just seem to spear off the road even before you really make that corner there. That, the bridge abutment there, there's, there's no tyres next to it there. And the reason for that is that uh, if there were tyres, all it would do would just throw the car back out of the racetrack. Now, pit stops now for some of the leaders. Jourdain comes in, Brack comes in. 
Christian Fittipaldi comes in. Carpentier and Tagliani both stayed out, I believe. Uh, now there's a whole gaggle of other cars coming in. Of course, Dixon comes in. He's got that right rear ring that's rear wing that's missing. Brack gets back out underway. Our leader, Elio Castroneves, did not stop, obviously. There you see Dixon's car. So I want to that did not stop under this yellow now and uh, we've got uh, we've got about I'd say less than an hour of running here towards the end of the race they're going to work on that car and try and get a new rear wing on that uh, Pat West car and get him back out into the fray but uh, it will be that man uh, Kenny Breck he did make a pit stop and he will resume in uh, left foot he's actually behind Christian Filippaldi that was the same uh, the same positions in which they came into the pits Again, an aerial view there of the incident involving Mimo Gidley. The Car FedEx Championship Series running at Road America, the Road America 220, which uh, it's not been, and at the moment we're down to the 160, and we've run about uh, 20 of the 160. So we are under yellow. There's Dixon in the pit, uh, Scott Dixon, having his rear wing, or having a new rear wing put on. No idea what happened to him. He was running uh, towards the back of the pack before that incident. He was running uh, in uh, 18th place was car number 18. And Jimmy Vassar, he'd been running 11th. We saw his car off the side of the road. And May Magudley, as I say, was running in 8th place. So the cars weren't uh, anywhere near each other, but uh, all uh, having some, some different sort of a problem. Of course, Maymer there, that uh, big crash. And we're on board with his teammate, that is Bruno Junquera as uh, they're on the uh, 24th lap and as you say guys still under yellow here this afternoon and uh, uh, Junquera is one of the cars that uh, did come into the pit so he is uh, toward the back of the pack so looking back on today's racing uh, there hasn't been a lot of it we've had 23 laps Elio Castro Neves has been our leader uh, from the well not really from the get-go because he inherited it from the pit stop uh, he is our current leader and has led the most laps and of course that'll give more important bonus points if he can uh, continue to lead the laps yeah that's very true and it uh, if you can do that that will negate the one point bonus that uh, kenny breck got for winning the pole and Breck, of course he led the first 11 laps and as you say castro nevis had led uh, the last 12 the biggest mover so far that's michelle jordan jr all the way from uh, 20th on the starting grid to second place he's running in a very good second place as well we saw him uh, take that place away from the championship leader uh, Kenny Breck uh, and uh, then we saw the problem for Patrick Carpanche he fell back a little bit at that restart and uh, we see now that uh, those positions you know it's, a, it's been a great drive by Michel Jordan Jr. so far and we'll see uh, whether he can maintain that for his final 30 laps or so been a fairly uh, hectic mayhem day as you see the field work their way around the track because uh, we had an amazing cloud cell burst uh, not long before the race. And so that uh, caused some decision making to be made and they decided to get the race going as scheduled. But we actually started under yellow in single file and ran single file like this for about four or five laps to try and dry the track out and make sure it was good to go. They decided it was good to go. Kenny Brack led from his pole position, Tagliani second right behind him. Uh, but then we discovered, well, trouble and wetness out on the track as Bruno Junquera made contact with Christian Filippoldi. Christian has, however, since fixed that side pod. So that contact there between Dario Franchitti and uh, Oriol Servia spinning off and then that big crash there for Max Wilson and Brian Herter and also Paul Tracy involved in that action as well. Those were on wet weather tires. We saw Michael Andretti getting a tap through, apparently, from Scott Dixon. He spins around and then, after changing to slick tyres, Mauricio Guzman tries to negotiate that river running across the road there in turn 11, heavily into the wall, and uh, also a little bit farther back uh, behind him, Toro Takagi, exactly the same thing. 
We had the red flag after that. There's Jim Swental, the chief starter for Kart. And they were able to do some work on uh, quite a few of these cars requiring damage. We then went back to green again. We can see uh, that was Alex Tagliani at that stage. Uh, uh, sorry, Patrick Carpentier pressuring uh, Castro Neves there at the restart, trying to get that lead away. He wasn't able to do it. And it's still Castro Neves that reads, leads this field. And there is Adrian Fernandez running now down in uh, 18th place. And uh, actually lost a couple of places in those pit stops and now at the back of the pack. Here we are, Bruno on board. You can see the different conditions completely. Bright and sunny skies now, but still under yellow. Elio Castro Neves is our leader after 24 laps. And he and Patrick Carpentier both seem to have had this freebie pit stop they got uh, when they did make their tyre changes during the red flag. Here is a look at... Uh, the, uh, the lineup after the 23 laps. Yeah, actually, that was, that was just before this latest round of pit stops uh, now, so we actually find that uh, Patrick Carpentier, having not made a pit stop this time round, he is now actually up into uh, second place after 24 laps, and behind him is Gilles de Ferran, uh, and then behind de Ferran is de Mada, and then Tagliani, Papis, Moreno, Canaan, Servia, and Jourdain, who was the uh, first of the drivers to pit. He was in second place before the pit stops. I said that uh, nine drivers uh, did not pit, so he rejoins in 10th, ahead of Fittipaldi, Breck, Zanardi, then Junquera, we were just on board with him. Behind Junquera are Nakano, Andretti, Franchitti, Fernandez, and Scott Dixon, who is back out onto the track, uh, right at the back of the pack, and I think they're still in the middle of effecting repairs to that pack west entry. Field makes its way around again past the quarry off to the left there. That uh, quarry is actually very popular. Uh, they sell a lot of all that uh, sand and grating that's in there. Uh, and they sell a lot of it to uh, the golf courses around here, Jeremy. Um, no, no doubt you'd have sampled their wares then quite frequently. <laughs> oh, no, <yes. laughs> exactly. It would be easy to take the golf clubs to the quarry. <laughs> There's a good view of the helicopter there. This is a, this is a static camera. Is it a static camera? I think it is on top of a huge craze. He's a brave man up there. But uh, look, it's, it's fairly breezy here too, as I'm sure he's moving around a bit. And there, uh, it's back down to uh, the target Chip Ganassi Racing Pit. You can see there that's uh, Chip uh, in the middle with the, with the hat on. And uh, certainly a lot of concern now for Mamo. Uh, he's a very, very popular young, young guy. And uh, we're hoping that uh, he's going to be uh, okay here this afternoon. He's uh, making now uh, in the, this start. This is his 29th start in the Champ Cars. He's 31 years old. He's got a birthday in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, the best finish so far of uh, sixth uh, place. Uh, sorry, second place, I should say. That was at Cleveland this year. He's really done a stellar job after taking over from Nicholas Minassian in that number 12 car. Now, of course, the Kart FedEx series is uh, one of the one series, I think the only one, that travels with this full medical staff and surgeon and an unbelievable facility here, Jeremy, that uh, is basically a couple of trailers uh, that fold out to become surgeons, uh, surgeries, and it's uh, absolutely amazing uh, equipment and uh, traveling uh, resources they have. Yeah, Dr. Steve Olvey, he's the uh, Director of Medical Affairs for CART, he's a uh, neurosurgeon, and Dr. Terry Trammell is an orthopaedic surgeon, those two have been with this series for a long time and they just do uh, fantastic work, and there we see Scott Dixon's car back in, certainly, certainly some uh, serious damage to the back end of that car, they uh, sent him out to do one lap and now he's back in again, and now they're going to try and get another rear wing onto the car. See the Pack West car. That's uh, Daryl Fox is the crew chief on that car. He's from New Zealand, as is Scott Dixon. They've done a really super job this season as uh, the rookie driver. He just turned 21. Hard to believe it, isn't it? He's 21 years old just a, a, a month ago, and he has become the youngest winner of any major international open wheel auto race. Quite a remarkable accomplishment he, for Scott Dixon. Absolutely. He almost, uh, his very first race at uh, Monterey, just finished just outside the points. Long Beach wasn't so good, uh, but then in only his third race of uh, his career on the Oval at Nazareth, Scott Dixon went out and won it. Also uh, ninth at Monterey, uh, sorry, at Motega in Japan, and third in Milwaukee, 22nd in Detroit, and a seventh place finish at Portland on the road course, 20th at Cleveland, fifth in Toronto, 
and he had a 10th place finish at Michigan. Chicago, who was 4th, and uh, last week at Mid-Ohio, uh, one point for finishing in 12th for Scott Dixon. Yeah, he's certainly been a remarkable performer this year. He started, of course, at the age of 12 in Formula V racing in New Zealand. He uh, won the title there, went, moved up into Formula Ford. He won the sort of junior series for older cars. Oh, my God, look at the damage to that car there. That is ter that's terrifying. That car's broken completely in half. Uh, they, did, uh, they did cut uh, the remainder of it. Was, it was badly damaged. It wasn't that badly damaged, uh, fortunately, when uh, Memo came to rest. But there was a lot of damage. They have cut that car apart to get him out of it. And we hear that he, he is conscious. He has been communicating with the safety team. Uh, and he is now on his way to the cart medical centre. Obviously, the hit was completely at the wrong angle because the front wing is still on at the front nose there, but that split where they are split at the front of the cockpit there, that is not uh, how that is supposed to break apart there, even though they've cut it apart since. But Yeah, it's, uh, the, uh, the jaws of life there to cut that part, but here's some replays. Here's a camera here uh, on the at the bridge above. You should see he loses control going into the corner, overcorrects the car and heads on there. And, oh God, here we are on board. This is coming through the kink here. This is into Canada corner. Now he's onto the brakes. Watch him go up the hill here. This is kink to the right, and then we'll listen as he comes up into turn 13 now. Ouch. And uh, you can see that it, uh, like he just straight a wheel onto. You can see him there, just a little wave there from him. That's great news from him. He has a lot of support. He's a very popular driver, is Maymo He started the sport relatively late. He went to the Jim Russell School out at Laguna Seca Raceway and enrolled there as a mechanic. That's how he got his start in the sport. Also in go karting as well. He drove for many years. In fact, uh, even up until a year or so ago, he drove for Track Magic karts in uh, major karting events. And uh, he's made his way all the way up into the champ cars with absolutely no money behind him all the way just talent and uh, ability and desire guy and great to see that way from Mamo Gidley he's been taken in the ambulance to the medical center we'll be back with more from Road America you see some shadows starting to come over the grounds here at Road America now as we get later on day, those shadows coming from the clouds that are also rolling in, but it is sunny on the one part of the track there, to the right, the main straightaway, that's turn 14 and the top of your picture. And then just to the left, as we zoom in, you're going to see where that incident took place with Mamo Gidley. And there is, oh, well, I don't know what, Chip Ganassi is going to be uh, buying a new car, that's for sure. Yeah, he is, that's, uh, that's the end of that one, that's for sure. And it's, uh, they've written off a couple of cars this year, Nicholas Manassi and wrote one off also uh, when he crashed at Motegi before Memo took over in that number 12 car. I'm just saying, no, just from that replay, it looks like he just strayed the right side wheel onto that kerb, turning into turn 13 on the right-hand side of the track. Got a little wobble on there, and uh, then he sort of, as he corrected the car, the uh, the tyres bit and threw him right and straight into the wall there. Heavy, heavy impact. Memo Gidley. Scott Dixon has still got another rear wing on that car, but they've been doing some ongoing damage, and he's trying to come around now, and he will make another pit stop here. Cool, that's got to be a handful through the kink there, even at reduced speed for Scott Dixon without a rear wing, with no aerodynamic downforce on the back end of that car. Going back to his Formula Ford days. <laughs> yeah, with 850 horsepower Formula Ford or Formula Toyota car in this uh, instance there. And uh, as you said earlier on, we, uh, there were some problems with the, the Pac West team and uh, paying the bills with Toyota is what we heard. Some problems that, did, that meant that they did not run on Friday at Mid-Ohio one week ago. They resolved those differences, and we're hearing rumours, and then a, and a uh, say again, they're just rumours that maybe Toyota, uh, in lieu of the full three and a half million dollar uh, fee that they were charged for the leases of those engines, maybe taken over the contract of Scott Dixon, and uh, he's uh, going to be driving for Toyota for quite a while. A heck of a talent is Scott Dixon. The yellow flag flies at the start finish line, but they're going to get one finger as they go by this time, and Scott Dixon has made it back to the pit area, and they're going to make a second attempt at getting that rear wing attached. Uh, they obviously keep sending him out uh, to make sure he doesn't get off the lead lap. We are under yellow. It was for a major crash for Mimo Gidley. It looked like an awful lot of head movement involved in that crash too, Jeremy. And there you see that medical centre uh, that travels everywhere with Cart and Dr. Steve Olvey. And again, here is the incident. Gidley coming out from the kink area, Canada corner. 
Yeah, difficult to see from that angle, but I'm pretty sure uh, from the onboard, we could see here is the onboard again. We're coming down the back straight and into Canada corner here. Heavy on the brakes here, down a couple of gears. And now accelerating up the hill here. And he got on the uh, wheel on the curb there on the exit. I think he does the same. Yeah, he does there. He gets the wheel on the curb and, uh, and he loses control from there on. He tries to uh, get the car sideways, but then it sort of spears off into the wall. And absolutely, there's a very little runoff there. Yeah, that's a pretty dangerous corner, that. Uh, and uh, heavy impact for Mamo Goodley. He comes to rest upside down. The car's safety team there, but as we saw, we did see that wave from Mamo. Um, and we've just got to hope that the injuries are not too bad there. And it's good to, good to see him at least waving uh, to his fans. And as I say, he doesn't have many, many fans here. As I was saying before, he's worked his way up through this sport the hard way. He's a really likable character. Went on over and raced, uh, did a race in England uh, five years ago. He won the Team USA scholarship and did a Formula 3 race at Donington Park with uh, Dick Bennett's uh, West Surrey racing team. Didn't actually, actually uh, have a stellar weekend over there, but uh, he certainly enjoyed it and gained a lot from that experience. We saw also earlier, Jeremy, there's a right across from the uh, pit box, pit lane, there's a camper, and on the camper is a massive uh, United States flag with uh, Mimo written over it in support of Mimo. And we're going to take a look at it again, again from on board, but look how much head movement there is when he makes contact. And I'm not sure if he's wearing a hands device here at this point. I didn't see any evidence of it when they took his helmet off. Yeah, the taller drivers have a hard problem with the hands device. It's uh, difficult to get them comfortable. You can see all those uh, bits of uh, carbon fibre there shattering from the side part of the car. It disintegrated, it hit the wall and came up and uh, sort of smacked uh, the side of the cockpit area there. I'm sure, having looked at that, Ah, I mean, there must be some injury to the leg, I would think. Uh, if nothing else, just from banging around in the cockpit and uh, bruising. But to see where they'd cut the car in half, or cut the car to get him out, for that to have been broken there must have been just horrendous impact. Yeah, certainly, and we certainly have best wishes with Maymo. He gets back in the right. It's a big break for him, of course, to join the, the four-time championship winning team target Chip Ganassi Racing, and he was certainly making the most of it. He'd uh, already, in the, uh, what, five races he's done for the team, has uh, led, uh, led a total of 133 laps, has led in three different races in his uh, six starts with the team, and scored 29 points, moved himself already, already up to 16th in the points table, and uh, I think was looking good to score uh, some good points again this afternoon. Finished second uh, in his second race for the team at Cleveland, that great race he had with uh, Dario Franchitti. Uh, what a race that he led a lot first. Here it is one more time looking back from the bridge. He's following that Damada and uh, just gets that cast to Idos and uh, he knows he's in trouble at that stage. And uh, heavily, heavily into the wall. You can see him he's following there. He's following the slipstream of Cristiano Damada going down to Canada corner there. And the great vantage point up there on the hill on the left hand side. And uh, you can see he just uh, gets that wheel on the curb. And, uh, Uphill and downhill from there. We're Dr. Go Steve, Steve and all of you, heads up the cart uh, medical and safety team. What can you tell us about Gidley? Well, I'm glad to report that he's awake and alert and talking. He recognized me, but he did have some loss of consciousness initially at the scene. Uh, because of that, we want to, and because of the mechanism of the accident, we want to be safe. We're sending him by ground ambulance to the uh, local hospital in Sheboygan for a precautionary x rays of his neck and a CAT scan. I, I figure they're all going to be okay. He uh, does have some complaint of pain in both of his knees but he's just bruised those so it looks like he got away with everything pretty good that's about as good a report as we could ever expect doctor thank you absolutely thank you well, quite unbelievably obviously didn't drive faster than his garden angel could fly there jeremy great to hear that mimo's come away with very few injuries of impact from Mimo Gilly because we are getting ready to go green one more time. Yeah, and just once again though, just a, t a testament to, to the, the strength of these champ cars. We're getting ready for the green and a good start again for Elio Castroneves. No, they haven't waved the green flag. They're waving a yellow here. Yeah, they are. Oh, I, I think it, I, I can only presume it's because that Castroneves got on the, thro on the throttle rather earlier than uh, Swintal was comfortable with and gave himself uh, too much of an advantage there. Uh, for goodness sake, at this stage in the game, with 28 laps in the books and we've been two, and a, two hours and 15 minutes into the race, I think we should have let him get away with that. Actually, Jeremy, he's had that yellow flag in his hand. I noticed that a moment ago, so uh, there must be some other reasoning behind throwing that yellow. We'll find out when we come back.
so we didn't go yellow. We'll try again here at Road America. It's, uh, it's been a trying day, I'd say. Yeah, it certainly has. And, uh, you know, he, he actually always, when they get in front of re ready for a restart, he always has the green in one uh, hand and the, and the yellow in another, just in case he has to wave it off for whatever reason. And, uh, yeah, we'll wait for a word on that. But uh, I think it's probably just because uh, he wasn't comfortable with uh, the jump that Castroneves appeared to get coming out of Turn 14. And uh, he was uh, a long way ahead of uh, Patrick Carponche now in second place. And uh, I don't think Swintar was comfortable with that, so he threw the yellow. And also, apparently, we're hearing that uh, Castroneves Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, we're hearing he was too close to the pace car. Well, I thought the pace car was already off the racetrack. So the pace car was in pit lane, wasn't it? Yeah, I'd have thought so. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that's all about. But uh, the yellow did come out. And this time, it'll be 29 laps to be completed and ready to go green. And I reckon about another 35 minutes to go, probably, uh, in this race. If my, I'm not quite sure about that. I think it's about 35 minutes, though. Don't quote me. <laughs> I think they're trying to do everything they can to make sure the fan doesn't enjoy the race here at Road America today. But of course, the reason we went yellow again is that uh, Maymo Gidley, and you heard Dr. Steve Olvey, is uh, sending him for precautionary CAT scans and x rays to the uh, freight at the hospital in Sheboygan. But um, apparently, just complaining of bruising on his knees, which uh, that impact he had. That is incredible. And again, you know, there's, there's so many safety improvements they made to these cars over the years. They've extended the footbox area in case of a head-on impact. And, uh, you know, with all the, the uh, construction of these cars, now it's a sort of a, a mix of, of uh, carbon fiber, Kevlar, which is uh, uh, impact resistant qualities that that has, and Nomex, uh, which is fireproof, of course. And it's a very, very strong, rigid structure, a so kind of a survival cell, if you like, in which the driver sits. And and everything did its job perfectly in that incident. Elio Castro Neves leads the field around the back part of the track, coming around in anticipation of a green flag. Patrick Carpentier right behind him. Gilles de Ferran runs in third. Cristiano de Mata is fourth. Tagliani is fifth. Papis is now in sixth. Roberto Moreno in seventh. Tony Canaan runs in eighth. Oriol Servia is ninth. And Michel Jourdain has dropped back to tenth. Don't forget, before we went to this yellow, he was running up in second, but made a pit stop during the yellow. That's right. He's the first of the guys. He's the first of the runners in tenth place who has made a pit stop. The first nine have not since we restarted from the red. But now it looks like the green flag comes out from Jim Swintow, guy. No, no way of being too close to the pace car there. They'd already taken the pace car off in pit lane. And now look at this Carpoche down the outside to Farron down the inside. But Castro Neves manages to hold them both off into one. Well, and Carpoche just manages to squeeze back in between the two, the two motor cars. And he has a look on the outside again. So Castro Neves defending that position as he is unable to do, of course, down into turn three. Cristiano De Matter too, also having a look at Gilles de Farron. And he's got his mirrors full of Christian Filippoldi. There's the matter again. This time he goes to the right. He's going to be on the wrong line as they come down into five. And great straight line speed there from the Ford Cosworth. But again, Castroneva is defending that position on the inside. That's absolutely fine. No problem there. That wasn't weaving. And similarly, De Ferran holding off ahead of Cristiano De Matter in fourth. Over the hill through turn six. The left-hander. 90 degrees. Now a run down into eight. Is it also a good chance for overtaking here? Not like anyone's getting a run on anybody, they're all staying equidistant apart from each other. Now through the carousel, and this is where we saw Tagliani unbelievably on the outside make a move on Kenny Brack last time. Yeah, that's right. And uh, 27 minutes to go, though, I think that uh, that graphic is referring to there. And that's going to be interesting now. It's going to be very interesting to see how these pit stops work out. I think we know that uh, the leaders are certainly going to have to make a pit stop. And the question is whether or not uh, the other guys that stopped earlier on lap 23 are also going to have to make a stop. We'll see how long this race goes along. But certainly Michel Jourdain Jr. And it's Tom Brown who calls the strategy on that car. He's the chief, the technical director for the Herdes Bettenhausen team. They did make that pit stop and they resumed in 10th place ahead of Christian Fittipaldi, Kenny Breck and Alex Zanardi, who also elected to stop during that caution period. It's looking like it might be about 20 odd laps then because it, it will check on the lap times this time by over 153. They're still a little slower than uh, they were on Friday and in the, on a, a perfectly dry and clean track. But at 153 with 26 minutes to go. 
tell you also that uh, Jourdain actually was passed on that first lap of the restart by Christian Fidipoli. There goes Fidipoli, here is Jourdain, and there is Kenny Breck. Behind him, Alex Zanardi, we see there, that's Dario Franchini making a move on uh, Adrian Fernandez. On the previous lap, Fernandez has got past uh, uh, Dario Franchini, and now Dario returns the favour. Now Dario, of course, and Adrian both started at the back, both had troubles in qualifying, but both thought they could come up with a clever strategy to win this race or get up to the front. But now all that's been thrown out the window with the yellows and the red flags that we've had here today. So at this point, he's running out of time. He's got a very few amount of laps to try and race his way up to the front. It's a tough, tough break for Dario Franchini, particularly if uh, Elio Castro Neves is going to be up front and score lots of points here again and Dario not get points. So uh, we're looking there at Max Pappas, he's uh, running 14th in the points, he has only scored six points since his win uh, at uh, Portland in the rain, what a great win that was, he really hasn't shown an awful lot since then, apart of course from Michigan International Speedway where he and Kenny Breck were among two of the leaders in a tremendously exciting race and Max now under pressure from Roberto Moreno. Moreno looks to the inside, no he can't make the pass, Max Pappas holds on to that position, that's 6th and 7th, so we see the race leaders there go through turn 13. Oh, Ponte got real close to Castro Neves there, now drops back a bit, you need a really good run through that back part of the track there, so you can have a good run up through uh, the main straightaway here, and then uh, make your move down going into one, try and get the slip stream down the uh, straightaway. There are Frank going off, this is, uh, looking back, he went off on that last lap, but it rejoined, and that's how Fernandez was able to get by him, and then for, Adrian, uh, for Dario to get back by him. Yes, and, uh, oops, another off then for Dario Frank Hidi, they're becoming a bit too, uh, bit too familiar, those, for a championship contender, and he's looked like he's, uh, he was up into, well, he was a long way down, he was, but he's at least in 17th, and uh, with a whole train of cars, and certainly a point-scoring finish uh, was well on the cards for Dario Frank Hidi, but that off has put him a long way behind. Especially with this new uh, time limit running here. Moreno and Pappas under the brakes. Up the hill to six. Oh, we have another yellow. Another, is that Dario? That is Franchini off. He is out of the car. And it, did he go off or did it? I think might be I don't know whether he just pulled off the road there or what. But uh, we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, where he is, the cars are coming through, that is uh, through third, where are they now, going into carousel aren't they, so uh, that's turn nine there, the carousel turn, we look at the Penske cars, strategy, do you see those, those are the cars that pitted on lap 23, and uh, the first nine cars out on the road did not make a pit stop under that caution period. Dario out of the car, and he will be mad because... It, it, take a look at it again. It, oh, oh, no, it's, that's uh, oh. some kind of a serious problem there. He pulls off, I think that's on the back straight, and uh, a major, major problem for Dario Franchini, and that one obviously not of his making, unless it was something to do with the fact that we saw him running off the road into the gravel trap just a few minutes earlier. Well, you'd think with Mid-Ohio and Road America, that's where Dario had his great, the best opportunities of really stacking up some points, uh, and has kind of leave both of them without any, and he is going to be absolutely furious about that, because... Uh, the, particularly here at Road America because this is his favourite place to run not just the racetrack but the whole uh, Road America weekend is one of his best favourite weekends it certainly is we saw a glance of Max Pappas now ahead of Oriol Servia which means that uh, Roberto Moreno did get past Max Pappas so Moreno now up into six and Pappas defending for all he's worth ahead of Oriol Servia Tony Canaan and then the blue car there behind Canaan is Christian Filippaldi and uh, Christian Filippaldi is running in 10th place and all the nine cars in front of him have uh, not yet made a pit stop in effectively what is effectively this sequence of stops they didn't stop under that previous caution period here again this is Moreno and Pappas going into Canada corner under the braking Pappas trying to come back but running out of racetrack there textbook pass there right by Roberto Moreno and he's been doing a lot of those last couple of weekends he came from a long way back last week at mid-Ohio and he finished there in sixth place did Moreno after starting way back in 15th it was a great drive there by Moreno and he's doing a good job again this afternoon now onto the tail of Alex Tagliani seeing Tagliani we talked about how the players guys have racked up the points in the last five races finish as they are now they'll pick up another 26 points for that players team but nope take away two more of those points because the fan oh he's gone off and he's got to get it back. oh trying to get it back on Carpentier he does but he's lost uh, three or four positions 
went off, ran into the gravel trap, onto the grass, kept his foot in it, but was able to get back on track right before he ran out of room there. But uh, costly, that was battling with Gilles de Ferrin for the third spot, of, for, pardon me, for the second spot. And now it is the Penske teams running one and two. Yes, they are. And uh, a good move there by uh, by uh, Gilles de Ferrin to take over that place. But he certainly didn't do uh, Carpentier any favours on the exit. He effectively just ran him off the road on the exit. And Carpentier goes off uh, onto the grass there and loses, what, four more positions. He finds himself down then in sixth place with a lot of dirt on his tyres as well. He's behind uh, the man of Tagliani and Moreno and he won't be very happy about that move it was, uh, he was just trying to hang on there on the outside line and he was, uh, looked to me like he was pretty much just elbowed off the road by Gilles de Ferris of course Cristiano de Mata, uh, has had that great opening win and then a second place finish at Long Beach then he had three races in a row where he really wasn't uh, very strong then he's been mixed results the last couple of races 10th at Mid-Ohio, 19th at Chicago and a 4th place finish at Michigan in that great finish we saw there where Patrick Carponte got his first win so it's good to see Cristiano back up front again and uh, try and keep himself in that championship hunt yeah, doing a very good job here and his uh, teammate as well, Christian Fittibaldi, as I said, he's, uh, he's going to make out like a bandit when these guys make a pit stop, which I think they're going to be doing in the next two or three laps. And that is going to put Christian Fittibaldi in the catbird seat. The only question then is, does he have to make another pit stop before the end of this race? And uh, let me just also, a quick word about Kenny Breck. He was running in 12th place at the restart. He's fallen now to 15th. So clearly Kenny Breck is struggling now in this stages of the race. He was strong in the wet, and he was strong in uh, the qualifying yesterday. That Ford, they, they seem to have the advantage here at Road America as far as... Oh, now, was that Tagliani? Or Carpontier, they just pulled off. The two Penches go by. The Mando runs in third, and it is Tagliani that has pulled into pit lane. Uh, just to, uh, going back to uh, that... Um, oh, also, Max Pappas has come in right there, too. Also, Tony Kanaan making a pit stop. Magdalene was uh, running in sixth spot when he came in. And I think Jordan must have had an off as well. He was 11th place last time around, right behind Christian Filippoldi. Now comes past in 17th. I can't look to okay if it can pass our booth there as uh, Alex Tagliani gets back underway there. And there is uh, Tony Kanaan uh, beating Max Pappis out of the pits. Uh, they came in in the opposite order with uh, Max Pappis ahead of Tony Kanaan. Those positions now reverse. The new, meanwhile, at the front of the field, it's a familiar side, isn't it? The two Penske cars with the Elio Castro Nevers out ahead of Gilles de Ferrand but not by too much. Just to finish off, I was talking about the length of the straightaways here. Seems to favour the Fords, which is what Kenny Brack has. And, of course, the players' guys have. So that, that's where they're getting their speed is down these long straightaways. But the Lola doesn't handle that well on these road courses. And that may be what Kenny's problem is. As you mentioned, he's now, well, he's now in 14th, but only because Papis and Kanan and Tagliani stopped. That's exactly right. So he's... Uh He's going to be struggling to get any points out of this weekend. He'll be very disappointed with, by that. That'll be two races in a row. In actual fact, it'll be four out of five. If he doesn't get any points this weekend, that'll be four out of five races, zero points for the championship leader, Kenny Breck. And if he doesn't get any points, he's almost certainly going to lose the championship lead to the race leader. Now, Elio Castroneves is coming into the pit lane, followed by his teammate, Gilles Defer, and also the third, fourth, and fifth place cars as well. This should get, well, depending on... No, it won't. I was going to say it was going to help put Tagliani up, but uh, now Tagliani, uh, Carpentier comes in, and Christian Fittipaldi inherits the lead with his Michael Andretti right behind him. There's the matter again. Time stop there. Tires for Elio. That long, long pit lane. I mean, you saw how quickly or how long that was when he came in. He's still in the pit there. Looks like there goes Damata. Damata is going to get out ahead of. No, he's ahead of Castroneves. He's not ahead, though, of Gilles de Ferrin. A good stop by de Ferrin. Obviously, a slow stop there for Castroneves. And he loses a couple of positions. No. This is for the lead. Michael Andretti, Christian Fittipaldi make contact. The former teammates in and turn five for the lead. And guess who gets it? Bruno Junquera comes away with it in turn six right now. <laughs> wild stuff there as you said there was a battle for the lead and a very desperate move there by, by Michael Andretti and this is the uh, the benefit of beneficiary of all that Bruno Junquera is into the lead of this race he has made a pit stop on lap 23 so he is looking in good shape now 
Wow, things are really changing all, all over the place. Oh, now we see Christian Fittipaldi off the track. Christian Fittipaldi, the blue light is back and the blue light is parked right now. Here it is. Again, Michael Andretti and Christian Fittipaldi. This is the contact at turn five. Well, he came from a long way behind there, but he's absolutely alongside Christian Fittipaldi going into the corner. They were, of course, uh, former teammates up until the, la the end of last year at Newman House Racing. And I think you have to say there that Michael Andretti uh, had, had the move made on Christian Fittipaldi. When Christian turned in, Michael was absolutely alongside him. Christian turned in any case, which is really a low percentage move on his part because it was always going to be contact at that stage. And you could see, just see, I think, as he pulled off, damage to the right front front wheel of Christian Filippoldi's car. Michael Adredi was able to continue and you mentioned Christian Filippoldi's damage to the left front there and now Michael Andretti and Michael I wouldn't want Michael Andretti in my mirrors at Road America with a Honda Power uh, if I was Bruno Junquera. No, but you have to wonder whether there was any damage to Michael Andretti's car. Clearly Christian Filippoldi's was uh, rendered an order combat after that. What about Michael's car? So it is Junquera, now the leader, the rookie. Michael Andretti with three wins under his belt here, runs in second. Alex Zanardi won here in 1997. He is now third, and Alex Zanardi started the day back in 23rd. Kenny Brack, amazingly, is now up to fourth, but again, those pit stops have helped him. Aiden Fernandez runs fifth, Shinji Nakano in sixth, Michel Jourdain in seventh, Scott Dixon is eighth, Gilles de Ferran is ninth, uh, and then Cristiano De Matta, who got out of the pit quicker than Castro Neves, now runs in 10th. And here's a great view there of the uh, impact there between Andretti and Filippaldi. And Bruno Junqueira says, thank you very much indeed, guys. I'm going to take advantage of that. And I'll see you later. Oh, the question is on Bruno uh, stopping. Yeah, they, they stopped at lap 23, we then had, what, uh, six laps of caution, and since then we've had uh, six laps of green flag racing. You could probably do, uh, maybe do as many as nine, 18, 19 laps, certainly, but, uh, under green flag conditions, and uh, uh, generally speaking, a lap of under yellow, you'll use about half as much fuel as you would do under green flag. So, uh, it's going to be interesting to see, we've got about... Uh, 14 minutes left in this race for another eight or nine laps. Can we touch and go? And I think that's probably why we saw Kenny Breck getting his place earlier on. He's trying to get to the finish without making another pit stop. And again, now that we've got the, the lap times getting down to what they should be at 144.923 for Junquier on that one. Uh, they were running 150 at the restart. But, uh, the track now should be all cleared up, dry everywhere. And uh, some sunlight on it, so it should be getting nice and grippy for these guys. So, with 37 laps left uh, completed, Junquera leads with both Michael Andretti and Alex Zanardi. Michael Andretti, who runs in second, now chasing down Bruno Junquera. He has won this race three times in the past. So, we've had five guys win this race for the, as their first ever race win. And they were Hector Aback in 82, Jacques Villeneuve in uh, 85, 94 was the current Jacques Villeneuve, formerly one Jacques Villeneuve, 98 was Dario, 99 was Christian Filippoldi. In fact, the first Jacques Villeneuve being, of course, the, uh, uncle. the uncle, yes, of the uh, 1997 Formula One World Champion, 1995 the Kart FedEx Series Champion. That's the um, Newman Haas. Uh, the Christian Fittipaldi and Damada team owner is the most successful owner here too. Uh, he has seven wins for Newman Haas. And it was looking good for Christian Fittipaldi there for a moment until he got barged off the road by Michael and broke the left front suspension. Yeah, and uh, I think you're just in that sort of situation when Michael's making a desperate move down the inside, you've really got to let him go and hopefully you can get past him again on the extra turn. But Christian committed himself to the corner and took himself out of the race. And meanwhile, that's, this is the man who benefited. Bruno Junqueri, his rookie season, of course. This will be his uh, 13th uh, race in the FedEx Championship Series. Will it be 13 lucky for Bruno Junquera? Looking back out of Bruno's car, looking for Michael. Those three wins I mentioned, they came in 1990, 91 and 1996. You hear Bruno through the gears in turn five. Look at that, there's actually still quite a good crowd on turn five, to Jeremy, despite the weather, the red flags and the yellow flags. 
It certainly is, and uh, just tremendous enthusiasm here, and uh, you know, they're real race fans here, they know what the situation was. Look at that, Bruno Schenkera jumping way up over the curb there in turn seven, going down the hill into turn eight, and almost using every inch of the racetrack there going in, and coming out as well, he's driving very well indeed. He pulled out a half a second over Michael Andretti last time around, 1 minute 43.8, clearly the fastest uh, lap uh, that we've seen, I think, in the race so far this afternoon for Bruno Schenkera. Alex Zanardi, and he will need fuel. He runs in third. He can't go all the way. It's amazing the amount of times we've seen this race, Jeremy, where uh, people have been running and then on the last lap, out and turn in the carousel, run out of fuel, in the kink, run out of fuel, can of the corner, run out of fuel, all on the last lap. Yeah, so difficult to judge here with a four-mile lap here and using more than two miles, uh, two gallons, I should say, to the lap here. Makes it very tough indeed, but Bruno is running a great pace out the front of the field. He's already uh, almost three seconds ahead of Michael Andretti, and Zanardi is more than ten seconds behind. He's losing a couple of seconds a lap to this man, Bruno Junqueira. Listen to that throttle, full throttle all the way down into one. Uh, here, riding the curbs there. Down a couple of gears into three. Great on board shots here. He's going down uh, the back straight there underneath the bridge. Downhill now down towards turn five. And there's a battle for third place with Zanardi now under increasing pressure from Kenny Breck. And uh, last time around Zanardi lost uh, two and a half seconds to the, the race leader Bruno Junquera and trying to hold on to third. And he'll be uh, hoping that he can get to the end of the race. We've got ten minutes to go though, as you can see, just under ten minutes to go now. We've got another six or seven laps and Breck looks to the inside down into turn five. Oh, Alex. Well, oh, you see the difference him. there? Yeah, he left him just enough room, didn't he, did Zanardi? And then now Kenny Brake, he does squeeze on inside into turn six. But again, doesn't force the issue. He wants to make sure he finishes this race. Can he make Yes, he can make the move stick going down the hill and into turn seven. So good work there by Kenny Breck. He always made sure he left Zanardi enough room. And uh, fortunately for him, Zanardi did the same. But then he overcooks it down into turn eight. Oh, no. After all that work. He'd done the hard bit. Uh, now he loses the position to Fernandez and Shinji Nakano. So now he's got to do it all over again. And Zanardi was not easy to overtake because Zanardi is trying to hold on to that position. I think what he's doing, Jeremy, is running economically so he can try and get the next eight minutes of racing in without having to stop. So he's got everything turned down and probably short shifting. Oh, Junquera has a bit of a wibble, wiggle coming off of 14. He's trying hard, this young man. He's driven a great race so far. He comes across. Well, that's 40 laps now in the books. 43.6. That's the best lap so far. And Michael Andretti just under two or three seconds behind in second place. And Bruno cannot afford a mistake, Jeremy, because as we talked about, Kenny Brack has signed for Chip Ganassi for next year for a lot of money to race for him. But Chip hasn't said who is going to be let go as far as Bruno Junquera or Mimo Gidley. And so this is a great chance for Junquera to put on a show and try and prove that he's worth keeping around. That's exactly right. And uh, we saw that uh, Kenny Breck there, he lost a lot of ground. He lost two positions, in fact, to the, these two cars. The two teammates of Fernandez racing cars, as Adrian Fernandez, and the pressure from his teammates in Ginecano. They no. both had all sorts of problems this weekend, but they're now running in fourth and fifth. No pressure there, actually. I just <laughs> heard that uh, the team owner has radioed in team orders for Ginecano to stay right behind him. <laughs> Adrian, of course, being the team. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And, uh, since he's come along, he's come along well this year. He's run uh, some very, very good races, and uh, on several occasions, he has absolutely outpaced uh, Adrian Fernandez. But uh, Adrian now he wants to get himself up into the points chase. He had a, a pretty dismal start to the season. He's had a couple of top fives so far, and he's run well in several other races. And had a, a bunch of niggly little problems that have put him out of contention. He's certainly been a contender in uh, for much, you know, for the vast majority of the seasons. We see Bruno Junquet there, breaking heavily down into Canada corner. Just under seven and a half minutes remaining. A terrible weekend for a team called Green. Poor Tracy got collected in an incident very early on. And then Dario Franchitti looks like he had a major motor failure. Uh, tough, tough for them. Uh, for team Chip Ganassi, very bad luck and nasty crash for Mimo Gidley, but good run for Bruno Junquera. And then for the Penskis, they were one and two. 
And uh, after pit stops, they drop back. Now Michael Landry comes into the pits from second place. Wow, and that'll, that'll drop him quite a long way down. It'll probably drop him out of the points, I think. We'll have to wait and see, but uh, he brings it into the team. And there goes uh, John Kabiski and the boys on that uh, team mode roller car. They're getting some fuel. It's just fuel only, no tyres for Michael Andre. Well, the third only just went by. That's Adrian Fernandez. Of course, that could have been Kenny Brack. So there is Brack and Fernandez. Nakano pills off into pit lane two. So that gives Brack another position up. Zanardi also makes a stop. The big question is on this man, Bruno Junquera. Wow, he cut that corner pretty uh, pretty sharp there. He's got to make sure he keeps it on the road. Junquera is our leader. Now it's Fernandez in second. Kenny Brack is now in third. And we'll figure it out from there. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, yeah, Fernandez and uh, Nakano did come in. Fernandez, he's known as being a fuel miser. I don't know whether he's going to be able to stretch it out in long enough to stay out in front of this field. It's a gamble that they've uh, they tried once uh, earlier on this season, did uh, Fernandez Racing, to try and uh, steal a march. And that, was, that was a model rate, wasn't it, in the first race, I think. And it didn't pay off. He ran out of fuel just a lap or so before the finish and cost himself a potential uh, point-scoring finish there in the first race of the season. Are they going to try the same again? And we're hearing that Bruno's going to... Uh, Come in this time. We'll soon see as oh, he runs his way through 14. Let me correct myself because Adrian go. Fernandez did come into the pits again on lap 28. I've forgotten about that. Right before we went green, uh, Fernandez was into the pits, so he's got a little bit more fuel than this guy. We, we hear now from the pits that maybe Fernandez does have enough fuel to get to the end of this race. Yeah, he's got apparently, he's reporting and they've got lots of fuel. He's okay. Bruno Junquera needs a splash. There's only five minutes left. That's about two laps, basically. And this is going to be about a five to ten second fuel stop. He was uh, so 24 seconds or so ahead of Fernandez. And so there he goes, and no sign yet of Adrian Fernandez. Kenny Brack comes in from second position. There goes Fernandez. Here comes Michael Andretti in second position. Now in third. Unbelievable. So there is Fernandez. And ahead of him is Bruno Junqueiro. As we see the championship leader, Kenny Brack, into the pit lane. I think Scott Dixon now runs third by my calculations and by my view and that, that would be unbelievable after having all those pit stops for that rear wing problems he was having. Yep, there is Drew Carey, he's out ahead of Adrian Fernandez, and there is a battle, well, not really much of a battle at the moment, Drew Carey still had a good lead, so a great drive by him, and there is Fernandez trying to chase him down, four minutes to go in this race, they've made their final pit stop, great strategy again for target Chip Ganassi Racing, there it is, he makes that stop, just fuel only. Watch right here. Yeah, watch over the top of the crest to the rise, there comes Adrian Fernandez. Great to get uh, Bruno out in time. Of course, they would have known when Adrian was down in turn 14, and that would have determined how quickly they're getting back out. He's got fuel to go all the way right now. So it is Bruno Junquera from the lead from Adrian Fernandez, Michael Andretti in third. Brack pulled in, so Scott Nixon picks up fourth. And then it's uh, Deferrin and Michel Jourdain. <laughs> so great stuff, and I think Sinchi Nakano must have had a problem in the pits, he's at the back of the pack again, he's all the way back to 17, so a long stop for Sinchi Nakano, very, very costly indeed. That was a great stop for the uh, target Chip Ganassi crew, to get that done. Whoa, oh. look at this lot. <laughs> there's Serbia smoking up the brakes there to get past uh, Michel Jordan Jr. And there's Roberto Moreno trying to make a move on the both of them. Uh, I think Tagliani and Carpentier picked up a couple of spots there too. Oh, Jordan looks like he must have a problem. second Michael Andre third now Jordan has pulled into the pits he was running out of fuel that was what his problem is and that's why everybody else was able to jump all over him in uh, kind of the corner now Michael Andretti gets by Adrian Fernandez for second yeah and uh, he's uh, back he, they were battling they were right together as they came past us uh, uh, past the start finish line and he has got ahead that is Michael Andretti as we said earlier on he's failed to score in the last three races and uh, four of the last five but uh, the one uh, 
race where he did score points, he scored a maximum 20 points for winning at Road America. So now can Michael Andretti track down Bruno Junquera perhaps and win the race? Time is ticking away. Well, he's going to be helped though too as far as the championship is concerned because Brack is way out of the points right now and Castro Neves will not score points for the win because he's also further down in about seventh spot right now. So this could be a great help to uh, Michael Andretti's campaign in the championship. It's certainly going to help Dario Franchini as we saw him pull off earlier with engine problems. So Bruno, the thing, the big difference about Road America in racing is he comes through turn 14 to, to score lap number 43 and he comes up over the hill he's going to get the white flag but the unusual thing about road america is instead of saying hang on for one mile he's going to hang on for four miles here which is a lot for michael andretti he's in catch up certainly is as a leader four and a half seconds there's, there's no way really that uh, that michael andretti can catch this man bruno junquera great drive great strategy and he's looking good now adrian fernandez third dixon fourth the fran fifth now the matter six, Castro Neves seventh, Tagliani got up to eighth, Carpentier ninth, and Oreo Servia is now running in tenth. There's Michael, look how close he is as they come down, shooting down to turn five. He made up a lot of ground there, I don't know if Bruno's conserving fuel. Backed way off, lap time was a 145 on the last one. Here's a whole gaggle of cars, we could see some wholesale position changes here, down to the inside in turn five. No luck for Gilles as he looks at Scott Dixon there. Yeah, just looking there and another great drive for Scott Dixon, looking good for another top five finish. What a remarkable drive again by this guy. There's Cristiano De Matta. he's looking to get his championships uh, challenge back on track after a series of very disappointing results. Through the carousel right now for Bruno Junquera and Michael is nowhere uh, close enough at this point. That's the kink. Safely negotiated for Bruno Junquera. Now we're a little more than a mile or so from the finish, but we've seen all sorts of drama here at Road America. Remember a few years ago, uh, Alan Jr. was comfortably in the lead of this race, and he blew up the engine right there. Well, the engine blew up, whatever, going into that corner. He coasted to a smoky halt. We've seen drivers run out of fuel here as well, but Bruno Junquera, just one more corner to go, guy. And this could be, obviously, his first win in the championship. Scott Dixon got his earlier, but we'll have another rookie winning and we'll have another winner in the Car FedEx Series. The checkered flag is shown for Bruno Junquera at the Road America 220. What a great drive by Bruno Junquera. And uh, what a great Philip this for this team. We've seen Memo Gidley had that uh, horrifying accident. And uh, Bruno Junquera, he does the good, does the job there for Target Chicken Assy Racing. He becomes our ninth different driver to win in the Car FedEx Series in 2001. <laughs> in 12 races, that's pretty impressive. Let's get down into the pit lane and talk to the car owner, Chuck Ganassi. Been saying all along, the object is to win races with these young drivers. Bruno has just delivered, but I know it's one of those days where your heart is kind of torn because of what well, happened to Well, we're torn Mimo. a little bit. I've heard Mimo's okay. I had a report from Dr. Olvey that he's conscious and alert. Everything's okay with him. He might have a broken arm or something. That's about it. We're pretty happy for Bruno. Terrific job for Chip Ganassi Racing. Bruno Junquera becomes the uh, first Brazilian to win this race since Christian Filipe in 1999. And he is thrilled getting his fir first cart win. Yeah, what a great drive. He really didn't put a foot wrong. Well, kind of did. He, he kind of did early on, didn't he? He had a spin early on in this race. And how many times have we seen that this year? Bruno Junquera, he had a spin and he dropped way back uh, in the field, but has come back all the way through to win this race. A tremendous performance. Kenny Brack uh, finishes 14th and out of the points. So that's going to, as you think, he's going to be dethroned for the first time in a long time as the points leader. As Elio Castro Neves now goes from two behind to five ahead and to take the lead in the championship. Yeah, and Gilles Deferre is not far behind either. Is he there in third place? And Michael Andretti, that's within a win or so's worth. 21 points, you get 22 if you win the race to pole and lead most laps. So Michael Andretti looking strong in fourth. Look at that. Scott Dixon, the rookie in fifth guy. Dario Franchini dropping down to 29 points behind. What a great race at Road America. It was mixed with rain, sunshine, yellows and reds. But it ended under the checkered flag for Bruno Junquera. For Jeremy Shaw, I'm Guy Hobbs saying so long. Be sure to join us for live coverage from Vancouver. You've been watching ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com.